Listen to The Astonishing Junk Drawer exclusively at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends. Trish has already made a comment. Ask us almost anything. Trying to find pictures of love cakes that are appropriate. If you're going to that degree, is that a red flag? Like just maybe someone else. No one's breaking into your uh, into your bedroom wearing your pajamas. Yeah, and I know another stalker. Well, I'll bet there's a lot of good vitamins in there. The good old days weren't always good. The serial number on it matches the provenance or the manifest of one of the planes in Flight 19. The dog in the 1970s version of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. I can't do any voices. Astonishing Legends would like to thank ZocDoc, Squarespace, Mint Mobile, Wild Grain, our contributors at patreon.com, and you, our listeners, for making tonight's show possible. Most of us go through life content to keep our experiences in the realm of predictability. Some of us like to take it up a notch from there and undertake more exciting adventures like traveling, camping, hiking, or even a combination of those. Beyond that, there are people who some would label adrenaline junkies. They take up skydiving, bungee jumping, or rock climbing as hobbies. Then, there's a group of people that go even further. The soloists. Adventurers and explorers who push the absolute limits of human ability. Often alone, but sometimes what author John Geiger calls alone together. Working to establish or even break records and write their names in history. These are people who experience things 99.9% .9 of us will never know as they navigate Antarctic crevasses, unexplored caves, or routes across the land, sea, or sky that have never been traversed. Many of them have endured great hardship at the hands of fate when their circumstances turn deadly, like when an unforeseen calamity descends upon them without warning. Sudden storms, failed safety equipment, and sometimes bad luck may conspire against them. In those moments, with the wind howling, their oxygen running out, their guideline lost, or their last battery dying, they often find themselves ready to fade out of existence, and maybe they're even relieved at that prospect. And just as they're about to give up, they realize that suddenly, they're no longer alone. There's someone with them. In their unsurvivable situation, there's an unseen companion, more than that, a comforting presence. And it speaks to them, maybe not out loud, but in their head. And while they can't see it with their eyes, they often know what it looks like. Sometimes it's someone they used to know who's passed away. Other times they can't really identify who it might be. But usually they will tell you it was a person. At least they think it was. It had to have been because it warned them of a mistake they were about to make, or maybe even advised them on how to get out of the predicament they were in. And once they were out of danger, as quickly as the ghostly help appeared, it would vanish. This is a phenomenon known as the third man syndrome, and it's happened a lot more than you would think. Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook, and this is Forrest Burgess reading in the style of T.S. Eliot from what some say is the most famous poem in the English language, The Wasteland. Who is the third who walks always beside you? When I count, there are only you and I together. But when I look ahead up the white road, there was always another one walking beside you. Join us tonight for part one of our series on the third man syndrome. back all three of us that we are folks wait what there, there's only two of us <laughs> i know i know I'm, I'm just leaning into the concept tonight and besides maybe there is a third man here well i hope not because that probably means we're about to die and it's like it's only tuesday <laughs> i know but it's it's probably just rich haddam just in spirit oh, okay. form. Yeah, right, he's stalking us on the astral plane as usual <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, folks, not a ton of housekeeping today, but speaking of Rich Haddam, just a quick reminder that his new show is debuting in about three weeks. Ooh. And the Midnight Library has just wrapped its ninth season and five million plus downloads. And on top of that, Scared All the Time is a few episodes into season two, with well over 100,000 downloads since they started last October. Yes, huzzah! That's right, folks. If you haven't already, find and subscribe to the Midnight Library, Scared All the Time, and even Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf, because his RSS feed is already set up and there's a trailer there so you can lock it in now. By the way, I keep getting quoted as saying Rich's new show is like Wonder Years meets Richard Haddam and his paranormal book collection, and I did say that, and it's true, but I forgot to add that if Wonder Years was rated R. Oh, we- <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's not uh, Wonder Years meets uh, Euphoria. I don't know what uh, I don't know what the, yeah, the shows the yeah. kids are watching all these days. Yeah. It, it is um, raw and uncensored, rich. But that's yes. how you would experience him in person. And I and if you haven't, it's such a pleasure to do that anyway. So it is uh, so candid and so just emotionally just raw. It's quite a treat. But again, just a little forewarning. So thank you for that. Fear and smoking yes, in Rich Adams' bookshelf. <laughs> That's the if you hadn't heard, that is the uh the warning that comes up on Netflix before Twilight Zone. I just thought. Oh yeah. Yeah. So yes. he Rich doesn't smoke, but he does uh, dole out a lot of fear. Oh, and just one last thing before I toss it to you. I found a uh, an IG post that I sent to a good friend of mine talking about the Wonder Years. This comes from uh, Chris DeRose at Chris D. Rose, oh. but I got it through via Space Monkey Mafia podcast. So shout out to those folks. The Wonder Years premiered 33 years ago today, 1988, depicting events 20 years earlier, 1968. A similar show today would be set in 2001. So how old does that make you feel? Wow. All right, it's time for us to dive into tonight's topic, third man syndrome, or as it's also sometimes called, the third man factor. Man, this is wild stuff. Ah, yes, I guess our good friends, uh, our boys Adam and Matt at Graveyard Tales covered this last July, so as usual, we're late to the party. Uh, Yeah, we didn't know that until after we started digging into this, but we can't wait to hear that episode after we get this one done. Mm. We have to be careful because they're super litigious. We have at least three lawsuits (laughs) going back and forth between us right now about topic theft. Oh, come on now. I thought we agreed to settle all of that out of court for a few cheeseburgers and some good whiskey. Oh, that's right. We we need to we need to give them a call. Uh, part Indeed. of that agreement was though, if we identify friends who've covered the same topic we're about to do, we always give a shout out. So if you're looking for a show like ours but different and you haven't heard it before, look for Graveyard Tales wherever you get your podcasts. Indeed, and I love their voices so much better than ours. Anyway, <laughs> so where are we jumping off from here? Well, I think we need to do a little bit of background about what this phenomenon is. Yes. With the cold open we did tonight, we didn't really put a story in it, which usually that's what we do. It's like one of the stories goes in there. <laughs> But these stories are so interesting in detail that it was too much for a cold open. So right, right. we wanted to explain how there's this idea of these ghostly presences or these unseen companions that seem to be coming to the aid of folks that are in dire need and, and possibly at the edge of death or a potentially dangerous situation. And so if, if we're going to talk about those people, we need to set the stage and I think explain to the listeners what exactly this phenomenon is before we talk about the stories that people have experienced. I think that's a grand idea, sir, because a lot of times we will have one weird incident, uh, Cisco Grove, for instance, and then we extrapolate from that of like, okay, are, are there any patterns here? Does this fit into any kind of phenomenon or factor as it might be here? And in this case, what you have is a factor waiting to be discovered through all of these other stories. And that's what John Geiger did. He had one story that he really liked. We're going to talk about that. And then he started to wonder, are there any more stories like this? And again, realized nobody was really collecting these kinds of stories. There's a component of this, and it always reminds me of when Micah Hanks came on a while back talking about Bigfoot through history, Mm. where he was saying, you know, these stories have been pervasive in multiple cultures, but people were using different words and language. The semantics were different. The nomenclature was different. And so then over time and across different cultures, sometimes things that should be connected aren't. And that's something that I always think about, not just with this topic, but with a lot of the topics that we discuss. It's like, are there cases here that should be related, but they haven't been because they are coming through the filters of the people who are sharing them or telling them or collecting them. And those people are putting them in separate baskets when maybe they shouldn't be in separate baskets. Maybe they should all be in one place together and we should be looking more at the overlaps. Right. Let me ask you this, Scott, do you remember... Another case here, another story where 
we had an author or a researcher say, you know what I realized? Nobody was documenting this and I had to be the first person to do it. Or they were starting to collect stories and realized there was nothing out there on this. So they took it up upon themselves to start collecting these types of stories and documenting them. Well, I think the most famous case of that where somebody was saying, well, no one was recording this. I think it's going to be David Politis with the missing 411. That's certainly one of them because he started to see if there were any patterns here. And that's the big argument. Is there a pattern here? Do these cases connect in some way? Or is it just an overactive imagination trying to put some weirdness that happens in every case that's natural, you know, hammer that square pig into the round hole of mundane explanations? That's not the case here where it was never mentioned as to where did this phenomenon start to be discovered or did it just start with one case as it may seem like here is some people will say like, well, you know, ufology and UFOs weren't really happening until uh, at Roswell. And before that, it's like, well, no, no, it, it goes beyond that, as does Bigfoot and Northern California in the late 60s. Right. It's always been going on, but nobody was really documenting it and putting it all together. And then that happens, and then there's really no starting date. I think this has always happened. And as we'll see, I think more so in part two, because it's part of the theories, is the idea of the bicameral mind. And the idea yes. of, of ancients, and we're talking about like the ancient Greeks, having in this idea that in these kind of extreme conditions, your mind will separate in a way, or there's two parts of the mind, and one will step in and like, okay, you know what, you panicking fool, step aside, I got this. And that's the person's other higher self saying like, just stop freaking out, we're going to figure this out, I'm going to take over, you just do what I say. And that's, of course, an overgeneralization of the idea of the bicameral mind. But that is part of the theories of what's going on here, perhaps. And that goes back to the ancient world, as we said. So the whole idea technically can be summarized or abstracted. Yeah. We found a real <laughs> academic paper co-authored by our author here who wrote this this really yes. fascinating book. I, this is a, a, one of those enjoyable ones that's not just super dry because Scott and I love adventure, even though we don't do much of it ourselves. We're no King of Phillips or J.J. Kelly, but we are armchair adventure enthusiasts and we love reading about these stories and about survival and under extreme conditions and, and all the things that go with it, especially if it's historical. And that's what you have here. There is a pattern that emerges. And I think technically in psychological circles, it's referred to as the sensed presence phenomenon more colloquially, uh, the third man factor. So to address that, there is a, a pretty good paper that's also <laughs> rarely enjoyable to read, but it is co-authored by Peter Sudfeld, S-U-E-D-F-E-L-D, and John Geiger, my apologies for any mispronunciations as well. And that appears in the book by J.H. Ellens, who I think is the editor on this, titled Psychology, Religion, and Spirituality, Volume 3, Miracles, colon, God, Science, and Psychology in the Paranormal. Boy, that also sounds like a, a terrific read. But yeah. <laughs> as we love to do here on the show, uh, we love to get into the abstracts of scientific papers to make ourselves sound smarter. So that's what we're going to do here. Uh, but, but in this case, it really explains what the idea is about. So that's what we're going to give you here and then visit the rest of the paper, I think, as we go on and as it pertains to how we lay out the story. So the abstract goes... People sometimes sense, see, or hear another being in situations in which the actual presence of another being is highly improbable, if not impossible. Psychologists refer to this as the, quote, sensed presence experience, end quote. Sensed presence experiences occur in a wide variety of situations to a wide variety of people, and the presences themselves vary in appearance, identity, and behavior. There are many kinds of sensed presence phenomena. They include psychotic, feverish, and drug-induced hallucinations, angelic and other religious visitations, ghosts, quote, corner of the eye, end quote, glimpses of someone almost seen or almost heard, quite common among recently bereaved persons, vivid dreams and daydreams, hypnagogic images in the, quote, twilight, end quote, state between sleep and full awakening, we've certainly talked about that, and misinterpretations of actual percepts, as when the shadow of a tree or the rustling of a bush is perceived as a human being or an animal. This happens to me a lot. Oh, <laughs> by the way, it happens yeah. to me when I'm driving, and I, yes. I don't know if, it's a, if it has to do with getting a little bit older. But yeah, I, when I drive in 
I'm constantly, especially this time of year, for whatever reasons, uh, squirrels are on suicide missions, and so are the <laughs> little birds. Out. That e- even though the bird can fly, it chooses to fly six inches off the ground directly in front of the car. Right. So I'm always looking out for that stuff, and a lot of times <laughs> it's like, oh, I think it's an animal, and it's a bag of leaves, or a leaf, right. or a branch, or something else. And then in my neighborhood, in particular nearby there's a golf course and mm-hmm. the signs all have roughly at the top they have like the old world sort of ball yeah. shape yes I know and then like about. a shield under them yes and at night i'll be driving and i'm like there's a person standing on the side of the road <laughs> and then i'm like oh no it just says that a new development they're selling homes from the 300,000s that's yes. what it says yes. but it looks like a dude is going to jump in front of my car no here's the thing that this all goes to part i believe uh, if you want to extrapolate that even further to uh, seeing patterns in shower curtains you know abstract patterns that repeat yes. seeing faces and things it's a little bit of pareidolia it's a little bit of pattern recognition or seeing things that we need to pay attention to as Our ancient DNA suggests that uh, if we do this over a million years or with human beings, 100,000 years of development, then it keeps the species alive. And so that's what you're experiencing later in this day. And on the other end of that spectrum, some folks have a phobia of seeing patterns or clusters of things like the head of a sunflower. Oh, that's a fractal. Yeah, that'll make them uh, horribly uneasy. So uh, anyway, it is fascinating to your point this still kind of goes on, but what the paper is going to say here is that's not exactly what's happening here with these people that experience this. Right. In that. And I'm sorry uh, I derailed you. Oh, no, no, that's, no, I think it's, (laughs) I cut into your abstract to get kind of obtuse. But this is what we're talking about. I said this on the show a long time ago. This kind of stuff rarely happens to me, but I did have, you know, when I was immobile, I did have the sense that there was somebody standing over my bed. It wasn't so much that I felt a physical presence, it was more the idea. And the idea right. started to freak me out. It's like, what if there was some malevolent dude standing over my bed and now I'm frozen and can't move and defend myself? Right. Now, but I'm glad you said that because th- I think something important to point out to the listeners right now, this is not about malevolence. This is about assistance in this case. All these experiences, as we'll see here, are almost universally viewed as super positive, life-affirming, life-changing for the better, by the experiencers and by the analysts and researchers looking at this condition. And right. what we have here is it's so it's a good thing, almost like the near death experience. And this is kind of ties in with that as well. More so, I would say you have uh, more reports of the negative experience by people going through a near death experience and it wasn't good. And then they come back like, Ooh, I, I need to change some things or it was terrible. And I'm not a bad person, but I think I needed to see that I needed to experience yeah. that for some reason. And so that kind of gets turned around. We had a uh, discussion with Rich Hanum about this. Either it's <laughs> happening within themselves in their brain, and we'll talk about that. Is it just a function of the brain, you know, seeing the the light at the end of the tunnel uh, before you get snuffed out, and that's just a tape in your brain playing that, like, oh, we're about to check out here. Let's just play the tape X, and uh, it's the bright light and the warm feelings and the warm fuzzies and the relatives welcoming you into uh, the other side, or right. is this extent, something outside of the body that is conjured by the crisis apparition in that there's so much human energy in an extreme moment that it's calling to something outside in the other realms to come help us because we need it. I think he might have coined it. Is that a Brandon Masulo term, the crisis apparition? I feel like that's him. I'm not sure if he did or He's not. That is the first the... person I right. learned about that phrase from. Well, getting back to the paper here, we we're talking about percepts. And yes. the, uh, I think it's Google here is trying to make me change it to perceptions. So you can think about it that way <laughs> in that it's saying the paper and the phenomenon in this instance is not going to deal with the sensory things that you're, you know, shadow people the face you see in the shadows of a tree or the rustling of a bush of like somebody's stalking me. And certainly, again, this ties in with so many things that we've talked about. Like I heard elves or fairies rustling in the bushes following us. Right. That's a different kind of thing. This is actually felt and sometimes seen. So anyway, to go on with the, the abstract here, it says this chapter will not deal with such percepts. Rather, we address experiences that are reported by people in extreme and unusual environments. And learn this uh, acronym, folks, E-U-E's, extreme and unusual environments. Yes. EUs, <laughs> which are of interest to psychologists because no obvious explanation presents itself. Sensed presences in EUEs may be seen, heard, and sometimes touched. But commonly, they are literally sensed. 
Their identity may be unknown to the perceiver, although even in such cases, people usually do know whether the being is male or female. Now, in uh, Geiger's book, page uh, nine, he does talk about a, a mountain climber who said because of the extreme empathy and, I guess, warmth that the, he felt, he sensed it was a female other yes. that was helping. Right. More on that in a bit. Continuing on. Sometimes a presence is recognized as a religious figure, friend, acquaintance, or relative. Folks, remember the uh, the old Star Trek where Captain Kirk is, uh, he's got to battle it out. I think he can choose your helper. Think of the first person. And who shows up to help Captain Kirk but Abraham Lincoln? Yeah, well, your hero too, right? I think he was That's a hero right. for him. That episode uh, gave me the creeps. It really? Still does Just because it was Lincoln and he was supposed to be dead? Uh, yeah, they didn't mean them to be, but the right. sets, due to the budgets and the time period, they were right. surreal. <laughs> it was pretty it surreal. It was like, yeah, that was Desi Lu. That was, I always like to point that That's out. That's right. Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz produced Star Trek. There yeah. would not be Star Trek had there not been I Love Lucy and specifically the vision that those two had. So and just as strange on the production side, I think about there is some actor who is an Abraham Lincoln impersonator and he gets lots of gigs. Yeah. And the last thing he probably thought was, I will never be on Star Trek portraying <laughs> Abraham Lincoln. And then boom, there he is. Yeah. Uh, helping out William Shatner. That is a form of that. I know I'm, we're being a little flip here, but I yeah. think that is somebody shows up. And like I said, it's not just like an unseen thing and you have this feeling. Sometimes people see these people show up or they appear as a solid person and then right. they disappear. When's the last time you went to the doctor, man? Oh, boy. Well, you being of a certain age, you have an important test you're overdue for, something everyone should get. Who are you, my parents? <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it. And by that, I mean, yes, you're right. I do need to find a primary care physician because it's been too long. But what's the best way to find the right doctor for you, you ask? And yes, the asking part was rhetorical, but this is an important question because what's more serious than your health and therefore finding the right healthcare professionals to manage it? A doctor, a dentist, psychiatrist, dermatologist, OBGYN, or eye doctor, you know, whatever the field or specialty, you need to find somebody who actually listens to you, makes you feel comfortable, and has a proven track record of delivering quality care. Sure, you could do what most folks do, ask a friend or relative for a referral, but don't we all know a friend that has that friend? <laughs> Someone we can't figure out why they're friends with because we wouldn't be friends with them? The point is, a medical professional might be right for your friend, but not entirely for you. That is so true. Your health and your doctors are one area, especially where you don't want to compromise or go the lazy route. And with ZocDoc, you don't have to. You know we're big on research here, and that's what ZocDoc provides, one of the best resources for finding the right match for you and your needs. ZocDoc is a free app and website where you can search and compare highly rated in-network doctors near you and instantly book appointments with them online. Precisely. And this research is so easy and comforting knowing you're not just throwing a dart. And ZocDoc is so easy to use. You just type in what type of condition, procedure, or doctor you need info about, your location, and then your insurance carrier and plan, if you have one, and immediately you get a list with ratings, highlights, and available appointments. With ZocDoc, you've got more options than you know. No compromises. Once you find the doc you want, you can book them immediately. No more waiting awkwardly on hold with a receptionist. And these docs all have verified reviews from actual real patients. We're talking about booking appointments with tens of thousands of top-rated, patient-reviewed, credible doctors and specialists. The typical wait time to see a doctor booked on ZocDoc is between just 24 to 72 hours. That's it. You can even score same-day appointments. ZocDoc was a terrific tool for me in my doctor search. And if you're in the market for a medical professional, I highly recommend it. And did we mention it's free? I think we did. Go to ZocDoc.com slash legends and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor today. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot -O com slash legends. ZocDoc.com slash legends. You know, a Squarespace website could be kind of like your third man or, or third person. What are you on about now? <laughs> you know, a powerful force to be reckoned with that has your back. Now, hear me out on this. Okay. The way I see it, in any endeavor one does, you have three elements. You, the content you create or the thing you make or the service you provide, and the means of distribution or providing platform. Squarespace is the guiding online presence, guiding your productivity and brand while guiding people to who you are and what you do. 
Oh, all right, then. Weird. But I kind of <laughs> see what you're getting at. Uh, Squarespace is like your visible higher self, oh. an online manifestation of you and what you do, what you present to the world. Well, yeah, I'll go with that. And, and now who's getting woo? Okay, but I like it, okay? Because whatever you, your manifestations, your spirit guides, what have you, are up to, Squarespace is your helping hand from beginning to end, whether showcasing your climbing expedition, selling your arts and crafts, or giving tarot readings. You need to organize your assets and pay the bills. For example, we were just talking about appointments, right? Well, you can accept appointments on your Squarespace website, offer online or in-person private sessions, workshops, and group classes. Squarespace provides everything you need to manage your schedule, accept secure payments, send automatic reminders, beautifully showcase your services, and more. Right. And if you sell goods or services, no matter if it's physical, digital, or on-site, you probably figured out that it makes sense to be able to sell both online and in person. Squarespace has all the tools you need to quickly start selling and make checkout seamless for your customers with simple but powerful payment tools. You can accept credit cards, PayPal, and Apple Pay, and offer customers the option to buy now and pay later with Afterpay and Clearpay. Ooh, flexible payments. One of the number one keys to selling. Remove the customer's objections with buy now, pay later. Why, it's like you're a big business. Uh, but maybe you're just selling your witch bottles and crocheted Mothman plushies at the farmer's market on weekends. Well, Squarespace offers in-point point-of-sale support where you can connect a Square Reader to the Squarespace SQSP app and then keep your orders, inventory, and customer data in sync with your online store. Bleeding edge. Don't think you have to climb that online mountain by yourself. Let Squarespace be your Sherpa. Just start trekking to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash legends to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Or use promo code legends. That's squarespace.com slash legends. Hi, I'm Ashley, and you're listening to Astonishing Legends with Scott Philbrook and Forrest Burgess. Now back to the show. Continuing on, they often appear when the person is weakened by exhaustion or illness, on the verge of death from cold, thirst, or starvation, lost and alone, or in an unusually stimulus-poor environment. There's a phenomenon that I think was covered in a radio lab about a guy being on a sailboat, I think with maybe two other uh, friends, you know, he had a busy, normal, regular life like we all do. And then he goes on the sailing trip out in the middle of the ocean, the breeze and the sun and the waves. And suddenly his mind starts playing Van Halen to the whole album in his head as if he were listening to a Walkman. Right. Right. And so how does that happen? And he couldn't shut it off. Like imagine getting a tune stuck in your head. And he said yeah. it was just as clear. It was like whole songs were playing, not just snippets. Yeah. And so like, well, what's going on? Why is my brain doing this? One theory is that because you were in a sensory deprivation kind of environment where there's, you were, you know, again, you're in the city. Now you're, it's just quiet and wind. And with your friends just occasionally talking and you're sailing, now you're in a bit of sensory deprivation. Your brain is like, well, this is too boring. We got to do something. Play Van Halen. You like that, right? And, yeah. I keep diving into this abstract you're trying to finish here, yeah. but the, the <laughs> other thing that it reminds me of is what they talk about with out-of-body experiences. When you try to practice them, they, they say at that moment when mm -hmm. you're separating from your body right. that the sensory deprivation, because you're for a different reason, right. not because you're on a sailboat, not because you're in a sensory deprivation tank, but because you're actually disconnecting your conscious mind from the privilege of your senses. Right then you will hear like a freight train sound or something. Something is almost just made up because yeah. the two things are separated and the subconscious mind begins to freak out because you're yeah. depriving it of things that it's, that it's used to having at its beck and call all the time. Exactly. That could be part of this phenomenon here. I After the movie Altered States came out, some of my favorites, just freaky. Oh, God, uh, you know, I have uh, never seen that. You're going to have to. I had a copy of Altered States written by Patty Chayefsky. And oh, wow. uh, so I started researching that, you know, I think when I was in high school and finding out it was based on the work of Dr. John Lilly and using sensory deprivation tanks. And one phenomenon that is common to a lot of people, but not universal, is that people in sensory deprivation tanks will hear sounds of buzz saws, or you feel like your limbs have separated from oh. your body. And so strange things happen yeah. in uh, stimulus poor environments, you will get this kind of phenomenon. That is just one aspect of the sensed presence experience here, or the third man factor. Right. Yeah. So to finish up here, uh, 
Most surprisingly, they do not just serve as companions, they actually help the person in trouble, sometimes by offering useful information or advice, and at other times by seeming to take a hand in whatever needs to be done to improve the chances of survival. This chapter, talking about the chapter that's within this other book, this chapter will describe episodes in which such apparitions were reported, analyze the causal conditions, and review the theoretical explanations that have been advanced for the phenomena. Last thing I'll say on this, and I'm not sure we'll be able to find anecdotal evidence to support this, but I'd be curious to know if somebody was supplying information on how to survive that they did not possess themselves. Here's a thing that I don't even know right at this moment, but I will know probably by the time we get done recording this episode. Mm -hmm. I haven't figured out whether the cases where those are mentioned in, in our research, whether or not they're anecdotal or backed up yet. So right. at this moment, as we're doing this part of the show, yeah. I'm not sure, but maybe 20, 30 minutes from now, I might be able to definitively say, no, this person definitely got information that they right. did not have themselves. Okay. It's outside the scope of their training for this scenario, whether it's a lost airplane, spelunking, uh -huh. mountain climbing, whatever. Did they get advice from the third man, from this being, from this sensed presence? Right that was outside the realm of their own training and expertise. We're going to talk about that for sure. One of the more famous cases, the one on Gremlins, we that's one of the first times I came across is like, oh yeah, I heard about this and we didn't really ever talk about it, but it was Charles Lindbergh making his famous transatlantic flight and yes. saying that I felt that there was somebody in the cockpit with me, just kind of keeping me awake, giving me encouragement, saying, you can do this. Yep. Again, it, that's just companionship, but he knew how to get there. I mean, it's not like the no, thing yeah, was telling him how, how to fly. No, he knew how to get there, but right. I feel like there's at least one story, and we'll get to him, uh, yeah. where someone was given navigational advice. Well, talking about William Shatner as a callback here, I believe it was when one of the episodes of The Unexplained, but there was a case which sounded to me like a missing 411 story, but that phenomenon was never mentioned in this episode, but it was a story of a little boy who I believe, he was pretty young, four or five years old, and he gets lost in the woods. You know, again, he survived. He, as an adult, is recalling that very vividly, and he says, you know, I'm lost out in the woods. People are searching for me, but I came to a fork in the road, literally, yeah, out in the woods at two trails that split off, and, you know, as a little kid, it's like, I don't know which one to take, and he remembers some thought, but he said there was something that said to him or told him, go to the right, go to the right and you'll see adults. And he did, and they found him. Now, here's the question that was presented in the episode. How did that happen? Of course, it's 50-50. People say, well, you just guessed right. But he survived. And if you chalk that up to some kind of, uh, you know, I'm saying not saying supernatural, paranormal, it's just that something, uh, that survival instinct, even with a four or five-year-old, told him to take the right choice is that because there were so many adults out there putting psychic energy into finding him and like, God, just call out. We can hear you. Just right, yell. Right. And they're, they're making noise. And he couldn't hear any of them. But they're putting that psychic energy out there and the kid just picked up on that. Or was it something like a guardian angel? Two quick things I want to say there. One is, and this is a mathematical observation, and I don't remember everything about my permutations, combinations, and probability. Right. But I do think in this case, it's actually not 50-50. I know you were probably just saying that oh, anecdotally. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. It's a 50-50 that he's going to go left or right. But it's not 50-50 that there's going to be people down either one of the paths. There That's might not true. be anybody anywhere. That is so true. So I think the odds are actually a little bit more against him in that right. scenario. That's exactly right. To make this point, yeah. people thinking maybe a little simplistically that there are people at one of the two paths. Well, guess what? He could be turned around in the totally opposite wrong direction, and there's two right. forks in the road here. This isn't the trolley experiment. He's right. out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. He could go left or right, and either one of them could mean death. You right. don't know. So the statistical chance of there being people, that gets into a much more complicated scenario. It's mm -hmm. like, is there a creek? Is there a campground? Whatever. But like, that's what's interesting about that. The other thing that reminds me of is there's an old Unsolved Mysteries, and I can't remember the exact situation, but I, I, I feel like somebody was lost, and this guy just went and got on his horse looking yeah. for this missing person. And he was like, I know where they are. And yeah. he just rode his horse out into like up a mountain. It was outside of LA or somewhere right. and rode right up to the missing person. Yeah. And, <laughs> so it's just like, and then like rescued him. And it's like, I don't know how I knew it. I just knew where they were. Exactly. There's, there's something. Yeah. So that, again, what I'm getting at with the anecdote here and talking about another episode we did, the Watsika Wonder yeah. With the strange reincarnated powers, perhaps, or psychic abilities of Lurency Venom. 
and Lawrence, people wonder yes. uh, parapsychologists William James at the time the father of American psychology wondered is this really some kind of supernatural spiritual outside of the body kind of thing or or what have you or is this just a an example of psychic ability which they found more credible which they found right. more probable is that she's not omniscient she's just reading the minds of the person somehow yeah, and getting the like, right this answers is what's really happening well yeah. to th that's what's funny is that for that time period that seemed more likely to them and now with yeah. all oh, that's all poppycock that's just ridiculous it's like well these were the smartest people in the room at the time right and that's what they were wondering is that how are they picking up on this and that again ties back to this when people are told somehow how to survive given practical advice by this unseen or sometimes seen voice or person or being that they feel is with them where are they getting the information a lot of these stories we'll just see with a uh, an injured uh, mountain climber who uh, got hit with an avalanche it's just something told him his mind just follow the drops of blood coming off your own broken nose just right. follow that just keep going forward well that's not really technical information but it was encouragement Sometimes it's like that, and sometimes it is. Take this right turn. The blood is technical information because it so. <laughs> tells you where the gravity is. It tells you which way is up. I suppose so. That's why you follow the blood, which I, I bet you they do train you for right. that. So that's actual technical information. But the moving forward part right. is not. And it's a combination of things that's coming from these voices sometimes. Now, there are some rules that Geiger and Sudfeld have come up with that are outlined in this pretty good Medium article this article is called, How Does Our Understanding of the Sense Presence Phenomenon in Extreme Settings Change the Way We Talk About So-Called Mental Illnesses in Daily Life? Blaze seems to note some consistency in the aspects of the experience here. And with that consistency, that points to something that is not just a one-off, you're about to die kind of a freak out experience uh, by people who may be mentally unstable. The article starts off saying, one, they occur in mentally and physically healthy individuals. Two, they arise in times of stress. Three, they are considered a coping resource that contributes to survival. Four, whilst there exist many theories, their source remains unknown. So to let people know there is no definitive thing or to say like, well, I could point to uh, the, the journals here and the textbooks of psychology and say, this is what's happening. Nobody really knows. The article goes on to state, starting with the second fact, it is crucial to note that the unusual demands of extreme environments and the unusual experience of the sensed presence are connected by feelings of stress. Stress seems to be one of the main factors that has to happen for this to be brought on. It's a trigger. The feeling of a presence often appears when the person is, quote, weakened by exhaustion or illness, on the verge of death from cold, thirst or starvation, lost or alone, or in an unusually stimulus poor environment. That's pulling from the abstract. The Medium article continues, the fact the triggers and consequences of the presence are consistent under many different conditions tells us that it exists in the mind, not outside the body. And that quote is from Michael Shermer from 2010. So I underline that because that's, here he said, a notable uh, skeptical thinker saying that it's not something all that woo-woo. It's just part of the brain. And when you get in trouble, it exists in the mind. It's a, a tape or a file that's played that helps you get out of the situation. That's my summation of what uh, Michael Shermer had to say about this phenomenon. The article then continues, whilst its source remains a mystery, what is clear to you, Geiger, is that the presence represents a force for survival, favoring theories that suggest it is an adaptive coping mechanism. So that kind of lays out again, not to get too uh, much into part two theories, but just that, well, it's just part of the human experience, but it doesn't happen to everybody. And people think, well, it just happens to like people who are a little off, maybe. Well, yeah. no. Continuing with the part of the Medium article that I'll, I'll stop here with, with reference to Sudfeld and Geiger's first fact, they note that few, if any, of the perceivers had mental health issues. In the context of these healthy and highly functioning individuals in extreme environments, sensed presence experiences are appraised positively by both the perceiver and theorists who suggest such experiences are functional for survival. This is in stark contrast to how society views hallucinations in the context of mental, quote, illnesses, end quote, such as psychosis or schizophrenia. Again, another really important thing to note here is as people might say or pass this off as like, well, you're just having a bit of a psychotic experience because you know, you're in a horrible environment, you think you're gonna die, and then you snap out of it. That does not seem to be the case, at least not clinically. 
So that's a summarization to kind of get us going here about what's happening here. But where does it start in, let's say, the popular consciousness or popular literature even? How do people, the general populace, come to know this phenomenon? Well, that's what's fascinating about this particular legend is that we can actually track it. And that makes me kind of giddy because a lot of times we just have no idea what the origin of a story is or how it becomes culturally framed. Even if you can track the story back to early recorded history or different stages of humanity, you can't always nail down what really put it on the map. And in this case, it seems like you can. So we're going to share some of the most fascinating cases of third man syndrome that are out there. But first, we're going to talk about how and why it got its name. And in order to do that, we want to take a look at the earliest examples of it being called that. So in this case, we're able to point to a poem by T.S. Eliot. Forrest read from it in the opening quote. It was written in 1922. And this particular poem is called The Wasteland, and it defines the modernist poetry movement. Modernist poetry was deconstructing what early 20th century poets thought Victorian poetry was. Too formal and pompous. Mm -hmm. Pompous seems to be the word of the night. It shifted the (laughs) paradigm of the language and the construction of poetry. It was groundbreaking. Ezra Pound, Robert Frost, Wallace Stevens were all modernist poets. Also, Randall Jarrell, whom my grandmother on my dad's side claimed to have been friends with, and if I'm not mistaken, may have even dated briefly. Really? Yeah. They, now it <laughs> reminds me of the, uh, well, that uh, that Seinfeld episode where George's fiance's father had a fling with a noted author. I'll just leave that there. And it would be, <laughs> but I believe, I believe your relatives, yes. That's quite something. Yeah, no, this was my grandmother. She actually went to Vanderbilt University in Nashville, which is where he went. Yeah. She had a degree in uh, being a librarian. Very well-read, smart woman. Her name was Luann McCaslin. She passed away some time ago. Uh, And that's right. I am uh, from Scotland and Northern (laughs) Ireland there with the McCaslin clan on my dad's side. And Randall Jarrell, coincidentally, he's actually buried here in Greensboro, where I live now, about 20 minutes from me. I haven't visited his grave, but every time I go by there... You know, there's a historical marker right, that says right. Randall Jarrell is is buried in a cemetery, really? you know, 100 yards from here or whatever. Well, yeah. well it's not him poking out from uh, street signs, is he? That's not who you're saying. No, no, okay. he isn't. <laughs> but, you know, but apparently, and I did not know this until today when I was looking into this, and I've been thinking about him for a while because I'm always thinking, oh, you know what? My grandmother knew him. I guess he was run over and killed while oh. walking his dog by a motorcyclist in oh. Chapel Hill. And uh, this was in the 60s or 70s where uh, Duke and Carolina University are. So anyway. A little yeah. sidetrack there. All right, so just a little bit of a brief background on the poem, The Wasteland itself, because as we said in the cold open, it's one of the most significant poems in the English language. And that in itself helps to show how the idea of third man syndrome went from one man's experience into the zeitgeist. Yeah. American poet Mary Carr, who wrote The Liar's Club, this is a memoir that she published in 1995. It's a bestseller. A lot of folks have probably heard of it. She said the following about Wasteland, and this is from a book titled The Wasteland and Other Writings by T.S. Eliot, for which she wrote the foreword. Now, this was published by Random House in 2001, but I love this foreword that she wrote. It has some now dated references, so get ready for a little bit of a throwback here to 2001. But when you hear it, you get an idea of how to react to the poem The Wasteland in the present day. So she titled the foreword, How to Read the Wasteland, so it alters your soul rather than just addling your head. (laughs) I'm just going to read the first couple of paragraphs here. The boundary between 20th century verse in English and its 19th century predecessors, romantic poetry, and the genteel Victorian stuff after it didn't simply dissolve. It came down with an axe swoop, and the blade was T.S. Eliot's Wasteland. William Carlos Williams said the poem quote, wiped out our world as if an atom bomb had been dropped upon it, end quote. Its publication in 1922 killed off the last limping, rickets-ridden vestiges of the old (laughs) era and raised the flag of modernism, under whose flapping shadow we still live. Oh, my. Mary adds this. By this, I mean that the poem exists as a kind of seminal instant for the aesthetic, and in some circles, moral values we espouse. The techniques it teaches are reference and irony, self-mockery and obliquity. These are the same ones championed today in art and culture at all levels, be it David Letterman's hipper-than-thou sarcasm (laughs) or the erotic self-mockery of Cindy Sherman's photographs, Quentin Tarantino's nonlinear jumps between scenes and pulp fiction partly derive from it, as does the oracular, disaffected voice of Cormac McCarthy in Blood Meridian, 
or the dreamy surface of Toni Morrison's Beloved. So wow. there's a lot of old cultural references there. But to her point, those are all really good examples that helped me in yeah. the modern time try to understand how subversive this poem was and how different it was because it was basically blowing up all the rules about poetry that were right, present right. before that. Yeah. So that's really fascinating to me. Knowing nothing about poetry, it helped me wrap my head around it. So Wasteland has five parts. The Burial of the Dead, A Game of Chess, The Fire Sermon, Death by Water, and What the Thunder Said. Now, we're not a poetry show, so you can go <laughs> look up the modernist poets for more information on it if you want. But in part five of Eliot's The Wasteland, what the thunder said, the third verse is as follows, and you'll remember some of this from the opening quote that Forrest read. Who is the third who walks always beside you? When I count, there are only you and I together. But when I look ahead up the white road, there is always another one walking beside you. Gliding, wrapped in a brown mantle, hooded, I do not know whether a man or a woman. But who is that on the other side of you? not knowing whether a man or a woman. Now, we just said often, not always, again, there are some templates to be applied here, but they don't apply to every case in that a lot of times the people will say they sensed whether it was a man or a woman. And That's I right. know we've, we've gotten some letters saying people like when, when they say, oh, that shadow entity, that time it was a female. And they land like, well, that's ridiculous. First of all, they don't exist. Secondly, how do you know what uh, gender it was? So right. what we're saying is that you get that innate sense sometimes and not that it was definitive, but just the gut feeling. Just as we say, sometimes people will see an entity mimicking a loved one who's passed and they know it's not them. You just know, you know, you just know. So this is a rare case, like I said, of knowing if chicken or egg came first with the name of the phenomenon. We don't always get that, but in this case, we have it. And we have some insight into why T.S. Eliot wrote this verse. This is according to the Royal Scottish Geographical Society. There's a footnote to the wasteland that T.S. Eliot says applies to the line starting at 360 in the poem, which is the verse we just read. And here is the footnote. T.S. Eliot wrote this himself. Quote, the following lines were stimulated by the account of one of the Antarctic expeditions, I forget which, but I think one of Shackleton's. It was related that the party of explorers at the extremity of their strength had the constant delusion that there was one more member than could actually be counted, end quote. So that's yeah. what Eliot said himself, saying that those lines in the wasteland that are largely attributed to inspiring the name of the third man syndrome or factor were inspired by what Sir Ernest Shackleton experienced on his ill-fated Antarctic expedition from 1914 to 1917. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get into the details of that here shortly, but suffice it to say, Shackleton and two companions were near death when they perceived that they weren't alone. But wait, that's four people, right? Well, there's three, and then... The yeah, that's fourth. four people. That's very astute, Forrest. Uh, <laughs> apparently, this is poetic license, or maybe oh, Elliot well. just didn't really know the details. It no, was in the story. It was Shackleton and two other guys and then one additional person. So it yeah. would be the fourth man syndrome is what it should really. It's been mislabeled. I think we need to rebrand it. I think we're <laughs> well, have to, uh, no, the three, again, the rule of threes. Yeah. Talk about poetic uh, license or just being poetic. It just seems to roll better. But also, look, you can go with anything, the fourth or fifth man, the fifth column. Yes, and there's biblical references, too, where the third person is Jesus resurrected. Talk and about so somebody third, beside that's, you. That's got to be, you know, the Trinity, all that. That's three. That's yeah, the three. It's, it's not the fourth guy. You know, well, it's yeah, the third. Look, there's all kinds of <laughs> memes and popular uh, plaques you can hang in your kitchen. Basically, uh, Jesus or God is walking beside you on the beach, and you see you know, a set of footprints oh, there. Yes. Okay, I'm being a, I'm being a little flippant, but listen to this. Yeah. I can tell that either God or Jesus, or pick your uh, deity, is walking beside you, lending support. But then I only saw one set of footprints. Did you leave me, oh Lord? It's like, no, that's the time I carried you. I carried and you, And yes. again, I'm not being flippant here. That, that part is where I came in and helped you because you needed it. And then once that happened, you're back to forging the path on your own, because that's what you're supposed to do. I can't be here the whole time. So as soon as you, right. that's another aspect of this. As soon as people are helped or they seem to be, okay, you see those people up there? They're going to help you. I got to go. All right, take care. Yeah. Go that way. Yeah. And that's yeah. what happens as described by a lot of people. As soon as there was an inkling of support being offered, or you find that lifeline again, or people have noticed, uh, hey, there's some guy up there that needs help. 
that's when the phenomenon stops happening. It doesn't persist. Yes. That's also fascinating to me. But in any case, what does Geiger have to say about uh, the third man factor and a, uh, a famous British climber? Well, that's Doug Scott. And one of the things that Geiger mentions in his book is that Scott was the first man to refer to it as third man syndrome. Uh, and this was in print in 1975. Right. That's one of the things that he indicated in his book, which was one of the sources for our research, The Third Man Factor, Surviving the Impossible by John Geiger. Mm -hmm. One of the things that he says in there is like, well, we th I think basically that Doug Scott was the first person to call it the third man syndrome. Right. And in this printing in 1975, he was referring to something that happened while he was climbing Mount Everest, where he essentially had an out of body experience where he said, quote, part of my mind separated from my tired self and gave me protective advice, yeah. end quote. So in this case, it's just him somehow yeah. getting outside his body, which is a little bit different. But he readily called it, in that scenario, third man syndrome. It's like, oh, yeah, it's third man. It happens. Yeah. You know, it's one of those things. And, of course, he's probably calling back to T.S. Eliot and Shackleton's right, experiences. Right. So he's probably making that connection. But that's how the idea of this is weaving its way, specifically with expeditions and mountain climbing. Yeah, very, yeah. very specifically, I think. Well, you're going to talk about later here the experience that John Geiger had as a seven-year-old boy with his father. Yeah. In that there's another aspect or fashion that this happens and that the person in that moment, that is the out-of-body part of this where they see themselves. They look down and see themselves being helped or yes. by somebody else or someone else coming. That's a very interesting aspect of this as, as well. That's almost like Zen Buddhism and the idea or concept of the higher self or the astral self. And yes. also, uh, <laughs> like the, I think it was mentioned in What the Bleep Do We Know? And that's a good way for, uh, or maybe a Zen Buddhist way to overcome a bad habit, to get out of that cycle, say, whatever it is, whether it's a, like a bad habit, overeating. It's a cycle in that something triggers you, you then have the same bad feelings that occur. And to get over that, you do something bad. That's, you know, smoking, drinking, overeating, drugs, whatever it is. And the way to break that cycle, because the same pattern happening over and over again, is that you try to envision yourself from a third higher perspective, looking down upon yourself, doing those actions. Right. And right. that snaps you out of it. And you, and then you repeat constantly in your head, I'm so pathetic. Look at me. Look <laughs> no, you don't do that. No, no, no. That's, uh, <laughs> oh, that's not what you do? No, you be, okay. no the, the other part of why uh, I haven't been affected. No, the other part of any of being <laughs> present, uh, John Cabot Zen, is that you forgive yourself. You don't beat yourself up. You should know that. Oh, your, okay. Your so fault. it's not that, look how pathetic I am. It's, oh, I need to, look at me. I got to fix this. <laughs> I probably shouldn't start a self help podcast. I don't know. That, that could be a, a, a great addition to the, uh, the network we're trying to. Uh, <laughs> Could be. Established here. Well, it's interesting that we're also broaching this topic because that's another part or aspect of the phenomenon here because Geiger talks about this happening to astronauts. And I yes. connect that to what's called the overview effect, that once you get out of the atmosphere of Earth and you look back down at the Earth, something happens to you. Yeah. Well, it happened to William Shatner going up in Blue Origin. It, yeah. <laughs> that's our third William Shatner Captain Kirk reference. I know. Me. Bill Shat making it to the all over. It's just happening all over uh, all over this episode. And it's significant because again, we're talking about highly skilled individuals, tested, trained. These people don't have psychotic breaks. They've been tested for yeah. that because that should not be happening when you're piloting a, a spaceship. But they will tell you that something profound happens to your psyche and that you realize how Again, I, I love the two aspects of this because it's how I view uh, the, my my life and worldview is that, one, in the context of the universe, you are not even a fly speck. You are nothing, a thought, an ephemeral gust of bad wind. On the other hand, you are also extremely important and valuable to those who love you and those you know and to yourself. So you have this uh, superposition of two being two things at once, very important and insignificant. And when you look back at the earth, you just see, like, as they say, there's no borders. There's no lines drawn on a map. All your battles and, and wars and the killing, and it's just silly. But you're so wrapped up in what your day-to-day -day stuff is and your, uh, your perceived grievances and your pettiness that you don't see the bigger picture. And when you, you have to get off the planet, literally, and then you realize it. It's like, wow, this is very special. But then we're a blue dot in the midst of perhaps literal infinity, and so, uh, yeah, you were again uh, holding these two positions, which is a very special thing. But 
Once again, these are not people losing their minds or having a psychotic break. They are just in a EUE. Extremely unusual environment, right? Which is different from an ROUS. <laughs> what um, is that? A RU? Or a rodent of unusual size. Oh, yes. Yeah, there anyway. you go. Well, so circling back around, there's actually another quote that British climber Doug Scott had said in a book titled Everest the Hard Way by C. Bonington. Uh, he said that he had been, quote, followed by the appearance of a man, definitely a human figure with arms and legs, end quote. So that's another thing that's really interesting about mm -hmm. the third man idea is that it does seem to be humanoid. That comes up over and over again when people can actually wrap their heads around what they're experiencing. So to recap just briefly here, the idea of the invisible third man actually comes from a famous Antarctic expedition that started in 1914 and lasted until 1916 after the ship the team was traveling on became trapped in the ice. Then in 1922, T.S. Eliot pens his finest work in what would become a world-famous poem in the wasteland, mentioning an invisible third person walking beside someone. In 1975, Doug Scott refers to it almost offhandedly as third man syndrome, and as near as we can tell, author John Geiger was the one who renamed it the third man factor when he wrote his book, The Third Man Factor, which came out in 2009. Just one little tangent here, we actually found digitized copies on the internet of T.S. Eliot actually reading The Wasteland himself. We found this online, but they're copyrighted, so we didn't share them here in the show, but his voice and delivery is super wild. Forrest, you did a pretty good interpretation of it. In <laughs> well, thank you so there, much, sir, but you'd have to be careful because <laughs> if you uh, if you say the with the same inflection or you're trying to match it, then you sound like you're mocking him. <laughs> like, who is the third who walks always beside you? Yes, yeah, I just want but to, that's yeah. what he sounds like. And, you that's know, there's a people, lot of stuff that talks uh, about, a lot of people have heard those recordings because he lived long enough to get recorded. And a lot of people say, oh, his voice is nasally and weird. You know, that's what they say about T.S. Eliot. Oh, I, unbelievable poet. Yeah. Not so great at reading his poetry, but I don't know. I think it's cool. I think it's cool. I love it. I love hearing that. It's a style of the of... time. And uh, you're yeah. going to be mentioning A Child's Christmas in Wales by another one of my favorite. Uh, yeah. Poems. Well, that's what I wanted to point out. We found not only these digitized copies of T.S. Eliot, but all kinds of artists, poets, authors. And if you're a vinyl junkie like me, you're into esoteric vinyl, meaning records or even poetry and some of the greats of our time. There was a company called uh, Cademon, C-A-E-D-M-O-N mm -hmm. Records, that recorded a ton of poets reading their own work back in the day. A lot of these older records can be found online for like 3 to $5 on eBay, wow. Etsy, places like that. And it's wild stuff if you want to hear famous poets reading their own work. Yeah. And since it's Women's History Month, I want to definitely point out that Cademon was actually started by two women in New York City in 1952, cool. Barbara Cohen. Yeah and Marianne Roney, and it's now part of HarperCollins Audio. Cohen and Roney recorded what is considered to be the world's first audiobook in 1952 with, as Forrest just said, Dylan Thomas's recording of A Child's Christmas in Wales and five of his yeah. other poems. I love stuff like this because recording the greats is something you can only do while they're still with us. Right. It took a lot of foresight to see that that was something important to capture for the future. And all the people that were involved in that, they're not with us anymore. But yep. that's a huge legacy that they left behind, especially uh, Barbara Cohen and Mary. Absolutely. Very, very yeah. Cool. So we'll have a link to mm -hmm. some of that stuff. Maybe see if I can find some that are for sale. You'll have to hit those links pretty quick because they'll be gone if you're listening <laughs> yeah. to this a few years later or months later. After all our years as podcast industry tycoons, pouring over the fine print and contracts, uh, if there's one thing that we've learned, it's that there's always a catch. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but I recently had a catch experience with some, uh, let's say, digital services I was trying to set up for my folks. After talking to three of the company's salespeople and one of their supervisors about paying for a service upgrade, I did a test and found out they weren't getting what was promised. I called their tech support, and after a lot of phone time, on-hold music, hassle, etc., came to find out that the service they signed us up for wasn't actually available yet at their address. And there's the catch. If you've been getting ripped off by overpriced wireless providers, when you heard that Mint Mobile's wireless plans are just 15 bucks a month when you purchase a three-month plan, you may have thought, what's the catch? Well, trust us, there isn't one. Nope, no catch, just secret sauce. And what is Mint Mobile's secret sauce? It's the fact that they sell wireless service online. That means they can cut out the cost of retail stores and pass those sweet, sweet savings directly to you. Yeah, and those really are some sweet savings. You've heard us talk about how much we've been saving compared to our old wireless plans, so now it's time for you to start saving big too. 
Yeah, and the quality is the same or better. I know I can honestly say my coverage is better, and I don't get throttled or dinged on data overages like I used to. That was a really expensive insult to data injury. Let Mint Mobile rescue you with their premium wireless plans for just 15 bucks a month and say bye bye to your overpriced wireless plans, jaw-dropping monthly bills, and unexpected overages. All plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number along with all your existing contacts. Ditch overpriced wireless with Mint Mobile's limited time deal and get premium wireless service for just 15 bucks a month. To get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash A-L. That's mintmobile.com slash A-L. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash A-L. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Okay, so we got this new thing that we're doing with dinner in our house. Oh, yeah? Yep, I call it hybrid dining. (laughs) What in the world is that? Well, it's where we make some of the food ourselves, you know, the old-fashioned way. Nice dinner salad, maybe even salad dressing from scratch. But for the main Mm -hmm. course, we use wild grain. Oh, you know, that does sound like a pretty good setup. That way, you can spend a little time making the stuff you know is easy to make because you're not exactly a chef. Y- yeah, well, it's, it's <laughs> kind of mean, but yeah, you're right. Oh, no, come on. I, I, I'm not a good cook. Well, this no, is no, no, I've had your cookies delicious, yes. <laughs> oh, I will well, this is that. what I'm talking about, though. We can lean on the astonishingly delicious wild grain options for our main course. Yeah. Wild Grain is the first ever Bake From Frozen subscription box for sourdough breads, fresh pastas, and artisanal pastries. This is delicious stuff, folks. So, Scott, you and Em make a nice salad, maybe cook up a vegetable side, and then have some wild grain fresh pasta? Exactly. It's so great. And a lot of times we'll use my dad's spaghetti sauce recipe Ooh, or yeah. one of Emily's mom's sauce recipes and add it to the wild grain pasta. It makes the entire meal easier healthier, and more delicious. It's a win, 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 win. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, what was in your most recent wild grain box? It was a cornucopia of deliciousness. We got a plain sourdough loaf, a sourdough Mm -hmm. rosemary garlic loaf, freaking perfect with pasta, by the way, fresh tonarelli pasta, fresh fettuccine, a tasty cranberry Mm -hmm. pecan sourdough loaf, giant chocolate chunk cookies, and of course, the the croissants. croissants. Yes. And folks, that was a combo of everything, but you can fully customize your wild grain box. So you can choose any combination of breads, pastas, and pastries. You can even build a box of only breads, only pastas, or only pastries if you'd like. Every item bakes from frozen in 25 minutes or less. No thawing required. For a limited time, you can get $30 off the first box, plus free croissants in every box when you go to wildgrain.com slash legends to start your subscription. You heard the man. Free croissants in every box. And $30 off your first box when you go to wildgrain.com slash legends. That's wildgrain.com slash legends. Or you can use promo code legends at checkout. Forrest and Scott, thank you for supporting their sponsors. I'm Kristen Albert. Now back to the show. So let's come back around to Shackleton because Shackleton, that story is the true origin of the third man idea because that is what inspired T.S. Eliot to write that verse in The Wasteland. By the way, you should read The Wasteland. It's truly amazing. You could probably read it in half an hour. Very evocative imagery. Mm -hmm. And and you can really understand why it was such a a, a seminal piece of work. But Let's talk about Shackleton now. Shackleton is somebody that I have personally brought up on our show, I know, at least a dozen times. Because a long time ago, before we even started the show, I read a book called Endurance, Shackleton's Incredible Voyage. It is one of my top five favorite books of all time. It might even be number one or number two for nonfiction. Right. So I've talked about it on the show a bunch of times. Uh, People who have also read it have said to me, why did you guys cover this? And I said, well, you know, there's nothing paranormal about it, even though it's got a lot of miracles in it. They are truly miracles of survival, but it's not a particularly paranormal story, or is it? Because Mm. the version of the book that I read was by a man named Alfred Lansing. He wrote it in 1959. I think he passed away in 1975. This guy is the original John Krakauer who wrote Into Thin Air, great book too, about uh, an ill-fated Everest trip, or Sebastian Younger who wrote The Perfect Storm. Mm -hmm. A lot of you probably saw the movie. The book is excellent. Love both of those. 
but books about people who are more likely to have a third man experience than, <laughs> than me or Forrest, because uh, yeah. we're just, we're not out doing that stuff. But endurance is a mind blowing story and nowhere in it. Is there any mention of an unseen companion right. or a third man? Right. Nowhere in endurance. But again, this was written in uh, or published in 1959 and Shackleton's trip took place in the very early 1900s. So it was written many decades later. So let's not get ahead of ourselves. We want to set up the story of what Shackleton endured. And this is a big story. It's not something that we can do in an episode or even a piece of an episode. So we're just going to do like an overview of it because it's important to understand how dire the circumstances Mm -hmm. must have gotten before he had this experience as well as the people that were with him. Shackleton was an Antarctic explorer who had been born in Ireland. Previous to this ill-fated trip, he had went the furthest south of any person in recorded history in 1909 when he got within 97 miles of the South Pole. Roald Amundsen got to the South Pole in 1911, so Shackleton shifted his focus Mm -hmm. after getting so close, and then Amundsen got there. Everybody was racing to the South Pole. Shackleton puts together the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition in 1914 aboard two ships, one of which was the most appropriately named expedition vessel in history, Endurance. The other was the Aurora. It was on a separate mission to set up supply depots. They did not take off in the same direction. In November 1915, Endurance gets trapped in the ice, hopelessly, like not come out. Ten months, it's stuck. It's obvious it's not only not going to be free, it's probably going to get crushed and sink. So the 26 crew and all their dogs had all been living on the ice near the boat all this time, trying to see if it was ever going to come free, but it seemed like there was no way that it would. This story cannot be summed up, especially in a segment on an episode (laughs) of Staunching Legends. We've not covered it on the show because, like I said, it's not necessarily paranormal, but there's a lot of miraculous things that take place. In However, it. I and will it, say there is a, a, a get not to, I hate to uh, bait and switch here, but uh, there is yeah. a strange paranormal story about supposedly one of the South Pole explorers finding a large patch of uh, subtropical greenery. Oh, There's a huge, yeah, it's a big conspiracy theory that, uh, what do you mean? It's no, it's not all covered in snow and ice. Of course, uh, oh, that's, that's say, way, that's way weird. out there, but uh, that's a story for another time. But yeah, it just put that out there <laughs> that it, there is, uh, and then of course you've got Nazi U-boats delivering, uh, the spear of Longinus and, uh, yes, all kinds yes. of fun stuff down in Antarctica. So Antarctica is very mysterious and rife itself with, uh, paranormal, lore but in this case we're just talking about just what it's like being there and what Shackleton had to go through and I think a couple of years ago they found a case that belonged to the photographer on the ship and they're glass photographic plates where you have a a piece of glass and the emulsion is painted on and they found some original photographs that I think that were submerged but it's so cold there they were fairly well preserved and able to retrieve images from them yeah there's also a lot of pictures that survive. Right. So th- because this overlapped with successful photography. So there's there's a lot of pictures from the rescue efforts and other things that happened. And in addition to that, I think in a couple of years ago too, they also found a case of booze, which I'm pretty sure went to Sotheby's or something. Yeah, I just yeah. saw a video. And again, it's in a luscious 4K. Somebody went and explored the shack. And of course, because it's so cold there, you go in and it's like they just left. You know, there's cans of food on the shelf, perfectly preserved. You could probably still eat them. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's just amazing. And you can get a real sense of uh, this is exactly the conditions they were living in while they were there. However, there are some very uncomfortable aspects of uh, that I remember from the, just hearing the whole story and reading about it in that, you know, they were trying to be on their boat and all they had really, again, you know, there's no North, North Face, Face, Columbia uh, sporting goods where there's oil yeah. skins and yeah. freezing water coming into the boat and dousing them and just the most horrific conditions you can imagine, the most uncomfortable, horrible conditions you can imagine. So in early April 1916, 15 months after the ship got stranded in the ice, the ice that they were camping on and that they were trying to hang out on and to figure out what to do next began to rapidly break apart. And Shackleton decided that they're going to need to take the three small boats that had been salvaged from the Endurance and put to sea. The waves at this point are three to six and sometimes 10 feet as they were in some of the roughest waters on the planet. Each of these boats is about 22 feet long. After three nights at sea, they saw an island, and Shackleton felt some of the men would die if they didn't land. So they headed for what is now known to have been Elephant Island, named for the elephant seals there. 
And that's good news because you can eat them, <laughs> well, which is good for them in this particular right. situation. However, no humans lived on Elephant Island. Right. So once they got in there and they got settled, they set the boats up upside down. They're trying to make shelters. Again, Why I don't know why I'm always bringing up Naked and Afraid, but you'd be lucky to have a boat on Naked and Afraid. They're building yeah. their bomas and shelters from a bunch of sticks. At least they had the boats that they could get right. underneath. Not like they were having a good time, though. But after they were there for a few days, Shackleton realized that he's going to have to leave men behind and go for help. They can't live there yeah, forever no. yeah. on that island. So him and his navigator and a couple of other of the high-ranking people that he brought with them figured out that there were three islands they could try to go for. Two were roughly 500 miles away. I think one was 550. The other one was 500. The third, South Georgia, mm -hmm. was 800 miles away. But guess what? That turns out to be the best one to go to for the current. Right. <laughs> Imagine, drive, you know, when you get in your car with your family and you have to drive yeah. 500 miles. And it's, oh my yeah. God, are we ever going to get there? Like how dreary that can be and and that's at 70 80 miles an right. hour these days this is imagine this 800 miles away so the other ones they figured out it's going to be impossible to reach the other two even though they're 300 miles closer in a 22 foot boat even the favorable route was through the nearly impossible to navigate drake passage mm -hmm. so six men counting shackleton went into one boat the james cared and they set sail on april 24th 1916 from Elephant Island for South Georgia during a break in a blizzard, yeah. which they had been also waiting for this blizzard to stop. And also, uh, I think it was Worsley, Captain Worsley, who, uh, Frank Worsley, who was a navigator. We, he kept climbing up and I'm like seriously climbing up yeah. maybe a thousand feet. He would go up and look at the ice flows and see, are we going right. to be able to even get out of this harbor, out of this little bay we're in? So at this point, April 24th, the ice flows are favorable. There's a break in the weather. They take off in this 22-foot boat, uh, which does have a sail named the James Caird. 16 days later, on May 10th, they arrive on the western coast of South Georgia, 800 miles from Elephant Island. Only problem, no humans are living on the west coast of South Georgia. Mm, now, there mm, are people, yeah. but there's no humans there. To this day, Captain Worsley's navigation of that trip with nothing more than a sextant, a chronometer, and a single chart is considered in itself to be one of the most astonishing navigational exercises ever undertaken by a human being. Yeah. The fact that he put them on that island across 800 miles of water and the Drake Passage in a rickety boat from the Endurance is mind-boggling. Yeah. So now they're on this beach on the west side of South Georgia. There's no people. They want to try to figure out how they can get to the east side where the whaling stations are. And they know where some are because that's where they actually started out. It was one of their first stops right. when they started out on this expedition on the other side of the island. At 3.10 a.m. on May 19th, after having waited for a break in the weather, which had kept them stuck on the west side of South Georgia Island, Shackleton took two men with him, they had already agreed to do this, and left three behind. And then they set out looking for the whaling station at Husvik on the east coast of South Georgia Island. It had been 17 months since the Endurance had first gotten stuck in the ice and 532 days since they had been seen on the east side of South Georgia Island about to start on their adventure. Husvik, unfortunately, was 28 miles from where they had landed in the James Caird. 28 miles from where they landed. So now they're going to have to climb three to 4,000 feet in altitude along the way, traversing glaciers, crevasses, and steep frozen slopes. If they didn't make it, not only would the three men they left behind on the west side of South Georgia die, so would all 22 left 800 miles away on Elephant Island. These guys didn't even take sleeping bags with them. Mm, they wanted mm -hmm. to go light. <laughs> they didn't even take sleeping bags. All these people's lives are hinging on what happens to these three guys as they walk across 30 miles across glaciers and mountains yeah. to get to a whaling community. They hiked sometimes for hours, only to find themselves at the edge of a cliff and having to retreat miles backwards and then try again in a different direction. Twelve hours after they had left the boat behind, at around four in the afternoon the, on the following day, the sun was fading and this fog was coming in and it was getting cold. And they were up on a ridge that was so sharp, Shackleton could sit astride it, one leg on either side. Ew. Some of this I took directly from the Endurance book, right. Lansing's book that I was mentioning. They needed to descend, but they were losing daylight, and Shackleton thought that they were at 4,500 feet in altitude, which meant if it got dark or weather came in, they would probably freeze to death. Mm -hmm. 
So after spending a brief amount of time trying to make some steps that they could descend on, and some of these slopes have been described like trying to climb down a, a church steeple. That's how steep they were. He was trying to make some steps. It's taken a half hour to make like four steps. And he was like, this is ridiculous. And he, he, Shackleton just turned and he looked at the other two men and effectively he said, we have to slide down. Yeah. The two men that were with him, uh, Crean and Worsley, they were like, well, what if there's rocks? What if we hit a rock? What if there's a drop off right. we can't see? To which Shackleton basically said, it doesn't matter. Yeah. We don't have a choice. We're running out of time. we yeah. got to just go. <laughs> You're going to die one way or the other. Yeah. So. Yeah, we're going to die. You, you know, we got to do this. And everyone's counting on us. So the three of them sat down on the snow. I think they put some rope under their mm -hmm. butts or something. And then they locked their arms and legs together like they were in a luge, except they didn't have a luge. And they went down the hill yeah. having no idea if they would live. They descended an estimated 2,000 feet in probably less than a minute and then smashed into a snowbank yeah. where they turned out to be okay. <laughs> After that, so we think, oh, good, they're gonna, they must be getting there. Well, it turns out they again then went in a wrong direction and had to back up or retrace steps again. Not all the way back to the top of that cliff, but still, they had to go backwards. Then they felt that they probably were pretty near Stromness Station because they felt like they could identify landmarks and ridges that they recognized but one time before, they had thought that too. And then they realized as they got closer, their minds were playing tricks on them. They did, yeah. were just seeing things they wanted to see. And now they were like, God, it's got to be there. It's got to be over the next ridge. And they had the chronometer with them. So they knew what time it was. Right. And they knew it was getting near 7 a.m. And this would be 28 hours after they had left the other men on the other side of South Georgia Island. And they knew at 7 a.m. If their whaling station was nearby, they would hear the steam whistle. And sure enough, they heard it. They heard the steam whistle and they knew all they had to do now was get down there. But the problem is they were still at an elevation of like 3,000 feet yeah. or something. It took them three hours to descend into Stromnest. And Ernest Shackleton, Frank Worsley, and Thomas Crean walked into the station there where all the people in that whole community had assumed the endurance had been lost a year and a half earlier with all hands. And they announced themselves. Uh -huh. In fact, Shackleton went in and he, he asked for the guy that used to run the whaling station. And then the guy in there was like, that dude left a long time ago <laughs> and, na and named another person. And then right. Shackleton was like, oh, yeah, I know him. Take us to his house. And so they take these three guys, got beards and they're crazy looking, you know, castaway, Tom Hanks, whatever. They take <laughs> right. him to the other guy's house. Guy comes to the door. When he sees Shackleton and Shackleton says, it's me, it's Ernest Shackleton. Yeah. And they were an acquaintance. The guy supposedly turned around and started crying. He could not believe yeah. that they were alive. So that's the first miracle yeah. of this story. Now, here's the bad part, <laughs> continuing. Due to ice flows and everything, when they went back to Elephant Island, they couldn't land. They kept not being able to rescue them. And this kind of goes to like the lost colony thing with, that we've talked about in the past where they came back, the water's bad, the weather's bad, the storm's bad, so they just turned around and left the poor lost colony. The same thing was happening at Elephant Island. They couldn't get in there. But Shackleton would not give up. He's like, no man left behind. We got to get in there. We got to rescue these guys. And they kept going back until they got in. By the time they recovered the people at Elephant Island, the 22 guys who were there, it had been three and a half months yeah. since Shackleton and the other five guys had left for South Georgia. So the folks they left behind were sitting there for 100 days, not even knowing if Shackleton lived. Yeah, They don't even know if he lived. And now he's coming back three and a half months later. And when they come back to Elephant Island, all 22 of those people were still alive. Ernest Shackleton did not let a single person die in the nearly two years of Antarctic disaster that the 1914 Imperial Transarctic Expedition had been. Not a soul. So that, in and of itself, is an astonishing legend. Yeah, and with a uh, Dr. Livingston, I presume, moment of seeing... Yeah, it's got that manager. moment right yeah, at the end. Just, well, again, nobody against all odds. Exactly. Like I said earlier, this is truly one of the most amazing books I've ever read, and I, I'm telling you, uh, we left out about 95% of the hardship those guys endured. If the overview of this story interests you at all, buy a copy of Endurance by Alfred Lansing. You won't be able to put it down. Right. It's an amazing book. But now yeah. it's time to circle back to the third man. Why are we telling this story? Because as we said at the outset, Lansing's book makes no mention of a third man or an unseen companion or any presence. So where did that come from? What's the part of this adventure that inspired T.S. Eliot? And why did Lansing leave it out? Well, he was not going to put it in one of the early drafts of South. And that's the other thing about South. And this is a really cool book too, which I would love to have, but it's currently going for 
two, three, four, five thousand dollars on all the book collector websites. <laughs> That's the oiled and tanned um, uh, uh, binding edition. Yeah, yes, the- uh, but the other thing about that book, and it was it was ghost written, is my understanding, right. taken from Shackleton's word, and it was it came out not too long after it happened. It was more, I think, nineteen twenty two or something like that. I'm not sure, but. According to the research that we've done, it's indicated the language is very right, flowery, right. style of the time. But one of the things that Geiger said in his book from 2009 that we also read was that at least initially Shackleton didn't say anything about that. But that later, I think I think I feel like it did make it into the book later. But I don't know. I have a digital copy of mm-hmm. South, and I'm unable so far yeah. to find a reference to the invisible third man, but there are other components of the story interviews that he did where he does make mention of this. And that's the next thing we're going to talk about. Where does this third man syndrome play into this? But the reason that we told you that little bit of that story, and it is really only a small piece of it. It actually was a lot worse than the part we shared. <laughs> you can't it feel was a the lot cold. worse. Yeah. The hunger. And yeah. The- but it was to give you an idea of how severe a scenario has to be for this third man, this third being to even appear you can imagine the circumstances these folks are under, not only the personal circumstances for their own personal safety, yeah. but the fact that for Shackleton and the, the other folks at the top of his crew, if they didn't make it, all these people that were scattered all over the Arctic were all going to die too. Yeah, It's more than just like, woe is me. It's like, I have a responsibility to my crew. These people are waiting for me to come back. I cannot fail. It's just an amazing, amazing story. So let's talk about where the third man comes into Shackleton's story. Because again, how did that get into T.S. Eliot's poem? How does that lead into it becoming a more easily identifiable phenomenon? So you look back at everything that Shackleton and his men went through. Like we said, the miracle that not a single person died in almost two years of people where they should have been dying every day. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of just amazing leadership on Shackleton's part and also the part of his group. It was very much like bravery in the face of disaster, courageousness, and in some cases, just luck. But there was also a lot of strategy. It just couldn't have turned out better than it did, considering that their boat got stuck. And then they had to go through all these ordeals on the ice flow and to the first island, to Elephant Island, and then off to South Georgia, and then across the top of South Georgia. And so what we find out is that for Shackleton later, he feels like the part of that trip that was the most defining moment in his life was that crossing from where they had landed the James Caird on the west side of South Georgia Island, and they needed to get over to Husvik or Stromness, to the whaling station. And that was 28 miles away. And that part of the trip was the part for him that was like, this is a defining moment in my life, or was the most defining moment of my life. I just wonder what the complaining level meter was are we there yet? I, you know, just because that's a trope, of course, that we see in the movies that are often depicting a, uh, a treacherous and uh, exhausting and grueling survival scenario, which I just recently saw with the first and original Planet of the Apes, where <laughs> Charlton Heston is, uh, he's got some trouble with one of the uh, the three crewmen who survives. And uh, they have different philosophies on survival, existence, and purpose. Well, there probably was, and who knows how controlled the narratives were that came out. Right, that's When true. you look at Lansing's book, which was published in 1959, well after all of this had happened and after Shackleton had passed away, in his book, he doesn't portray any sort of significant arguing about what to do, although there clearly were debates. But one of the things it reminds me of is like Master and Commander, mm-hmm. which, and I haven't read that book, it's supposed to be amazing, but in the movie, there's always the hierarchy the structure is in place right. and it stays locked down. It's like we have these unfortunate circumstances. These are our choices. We can have a strong debate about it. But yeah. in the end, captain says what's happening and that's what everyone's going to do no matter how much they do or don't agree with the captain. Yeah. And that's the feeling that you get on the Shackleton journey right. is that this is the way it is. And they do have letters that he left. Every time he left people behind, he wrote a letter into one of the diaries that the person had. And it's here, I'm leaving, you're in charge, you know what to do, we'll be back for you. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing when he left the three guys on the west coast of South Georgia. We're leaving, we're going to go get help, we'll be back for you, you're in charge. And it seemed like the people were just like, okay. But The other things that you do read about in Endurance, though, if you decide to go out and get Lansing's book, which again, I highly recommend, the bigger struggle was less about power and more about giving up. 
because mm-hmm. a lot of the men were suicidal or they yeah. wanted to just give up. They were ready to die. At least that's how it's portrayed in the narratives. Right. Now, if you look at the book that preceded the Endurance book by Lansing, the original book, South, which is the one that supposedly Shackleton wrote, was actually ghostwritten by a man named Saunders. And in that book is written in the very flowery, heroic language of the time. And there's probably some details maybe left out of that. I don't know. I haven't read South. It's actually available on Kindle. I have it. It's a long book, and I haven't ever had a chance to read it. And I I would love to read it, actually, considering how much I enjoyed Endurance, the later take on it, the 1959 take. But one of the things that happens in South is some of the details were omitted from the first draft. And that brings us to The Third Man. So one of the things that Geiger says on page 34 of his book, The Third Man Factor, this is the one that was published in 2009 about all kinds of different third man cases, and specifically in this section about Shackleton's, is he mentions that Frank Worsley, Captain Frank Worsley, who was the navigator who managed to get them in that small boat from Elephant Island 800 miles across the Drake Passage to the South Georgia Island, Worsley later said three weeks after they had made their way to safety, that he, quote, had a curious feeling on the march that there was another person with us, end quote. And when he came out with that, the other person that was with him and Shackleton Crean said that he had the same sensation. So it turned out each of the three men had come to the same conclusion independently of the others. And we know that Shackleton felt that way too because he said the following, quote, when I look back at those days, I have no doubt that Providence guided us, not only across those snow fields, but across the storm-white sea that separated Elephant Island from our landing place on South Georgia. I know that during that long and racking march of 36 hours over the unnamed mountains and glaciers of South Georgia, it seemed to me often that we were four, not three. That brings us back, interestingly, to the fact that this was a fourth man, Mm -hmm. (laughs) not a third man. We've already talked about that. But in this case, and and later when T.S. Eliot writes The Wasteland, He says the third man, but in this case, it was a fourth man. One question that I have, and I don't think it's abundantly clear, is whether all three of these folks in Shackleton's final party that were making their way across the island to the Stromness whaling station, is the person that they each sensed, was that something different to each one of them? Or were they sensing the same individual? And so we'll talk a little bit about other cases like that, where are multiple people interacting with what they perceive as one similar being, or does each have their own pet being, Mm -hmm. you know, their own tulpa of a sort or whatever it happens to be. Apparently, Shackleton didn't mention this extra being to anybody else. And when he was dictating these events to his ghostwriter, Saunders, who wrote the book South, which came out in 1917, the one that we were just talking about, he didn't say anything about this sensation of another being when they were crossing South Georgia. So the question is, why didn't it come up then? And what are the reasons that he didn't mention it at first? And there are some folks that speculate that when he came out with it, that this was just an attempt to latch on to some kind of spirituality and get that worked into the narrative. Mm -hmm. This idea, oh, it was divine providence, because the story is already so spectacular. Why don't we bring God into it? Or (laughs) some idea of, you know, mystery... There's never an implication that it's a ghost or a dead person in this particular case. It's just that someone was with us, the comforting presence, the unseen companion. Well, most of the cases that we've come across, I would say the majority of them don't mention something religious, although that is an aspect of it. As we mentioned at the beginning, that can be a factor in the description or the feeling of the presence. But most of the time, it seems it's just somebody else. And it's a comforting factor. It's not scary. Like, oh, my God, somebody's looking at me. That is that feeling of somebody watching you or being there, sometimes seen, sometimes unseen, or just a voice. Sometimes the person talks to them. And one case we'll cover here, the person had a conversation with them in their head. And it's no words were spoken, but I was conversing with this person. And when I turned around, I was actually surprised to not see them. And so... It's not just a bunch of religious delusion. It's pretty secular, it seems to me. But the thing I'll say about a lot of these cases, which you just mentioned, it often comes on, this third man phenomenon, when the person has decided they've given up and they're going to die. They're just going to accept death. One of the cases covered by Geiger was uh, two mountain climbers, James Savigny and Richard Whitmire, who had decided to climb Delta Form, which is in the Canadian Rockies near Lake Louise. And they get caught in an avalanche in this gully. And Savigny is severely injured. And 
James is dead. He's just really busted up. And at that point, Savini recalls, quote, it told me what to do. And he's talking about the presence. The only decision I had made at that point in time was to lie down next to Rick and to fall asleep and to accept death. That's the only decision I made. All decisions made subsequent to that were made by the presence. I was merely taking instructions. I understood what it wanted me to do. It wanted me to live. And in another case involving uh, an underwater cave and expert divers here, Stephanie Schwab, or Schwab, S-C-H-W-A-B-E, was diving alone because her husband, who was a cave diving expert, especially on the blue holes of the Bahamas here, he had passed away earlier that year when he failed to surface in a dive in the Red Sea. And she was left alone to continue their work and exploration scientifically on these caves and found herself uh, having lost the guideline into the cave. Now she's in the dark. Now her oxygen is running out. She's got about 30 minutes left and she starts to panic. First of all, going in a cave is dangerous, period. Spelunking is a very skilled talent that you have to be well-trained in. Doing it underwater is <laughs> another level. And this particular cave that she had gone into, the access to get to it and to get in there and to do the research, and a lot of it was, I think it had to do with soil samples. At one point, they were trying, her and her husband were capturing soil and bringing it to the surface for scientists who were trying to determine its origins, which oftentimes was the Middle East or something like that. Was, right, there was another scientist she was gathering it for who was studying sands blown across yes. all the way from the Sahara. Right, right. So that's super fascinating. And so she had gone down, she had gone horizontal, she had gone into this cave, and she was like, okay, you know, I've got a few minutes left, it's time to go back out. And like you said, she couldn't find the guideline. And she couldn't figure out why she had let that happen. And one of the things that she realized was that when she was diving with her now deceased husband, Palmer, he was always the one in right. charge of getting in and out. And he was in charge of the guidelines. So she had been relying on him. And now she's in this moment where it's like, oh, wait, I'm relying on someone who's not here and I'm alone and mm -hmm. I cannot see it anywhere and I'm going to die. I'm going to die in this cave because I don't know how to get back And it was a flood out. of emotions. She was angry at him for dying. And, and she says here in a quote, for all intents and purposes, at that moment, I had given up on life. I was ready to leave this world. I was so depressed and I missed Rob so much. I had had enough of the pain. And then suddenly, as she's uh, thinking that this is it, I'm just going to accept this and this will be my fate, she said... I suddenly felt flushed, and it seemed like my field of vision had become brighter. And then she vividly felt the presence of another being with her. And there was no doubt in her mind that someone was with her in the cave, and that someone was her dead husband. And she heard his voice communicating mentally with her, quote, all right, Steffi, calm down. Remember, believe you can, believe you can't. Either way, you're right. Remember? And it's something that her husband used to say to her all the time, and it got her to calm down, and she started thinking again, rationally, and as she sat on the cave floor, quote, trying to get a handle on why my brain was going this route, uh, 15 minutes passed, and she looks up, yes. and she, with this new resolve and calm, sees the white guideline again in the dark and finds her way out. Yes. And as she said, I love this part, today was not a good day to die. And she felt as if she'd been saved. Yeah. <laughs> Which <laughs> always makes me think of Chief Dan Little George, Man, the movie. There is a sense where Chief Dan George's third man is Dustin Hoffman in a way, guiding him through. And he said, like, you know what? That's they right. can't see us, perhaps. Maybe we just walk out of here. <laughs> and then yeah. when you're at that last moment, and this is such a uh, a typical thing, not only in uh, literature and legend and stories, and a lot in the Bible stories, you have to be at your very last thread here, your very last straw. You're about to expire. Right. You've given up all hope, and that's when you get rescued. That's when the helping hand comes. Literally at the end of your rope, or you've lost your rope, or the bitter end, which, by the way, is the very last bit of an anchor line. Yeah. When you get to the bit, if you, you lose go. the bitter end, it's gone. It's a maritime expression. And uh, the passage you just read was on, on page 12 of the Third Man Factor of Geiger's book. But the other interesting thing is that she said, and this, by the way, matches a lot of these stories, when she found the guideline and she knew that she was going to make it out, she suddenly and instantly knew that she was alone again. Yes, that's right, right. Whatever had been there, had it been her husband, had it been whatever it needed to be for her, and we often say, when you're the experiencer, it's about what it means to you, regardless mm -hmm. of what it may actually be. 
in that moment. But when she found that guideline, whatever that presence she was feeling psychologically and in her mind, it evaporated instantaneously. And that's the point we made earlier in that, right. okay, perhaps it's just a function of your own brain. And it's like, look, you know, you can find this guideline, but you're going to have to calm down. You're going to have to not give right. up and find the will to live and find your courage and you can do this. And maybe that's an aspect of her brain, but it's also a, an interesting, I say, uh, again, I, what's the purpose of this? Because it could have just been her own mind. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, come on, Steffi, calm down. You can do this. This being said to herself, you know, it's like, come on, just calm down. You know, panicking is not going to help. Just take a moment here, take a look around, feel around for it. You can find this, but it wasn't herself calming down. It had to be an outside no. and comforting presence of somebody who passed who usually did that job for her. Right. But also, this is one of those cases where we can't categorically say she was given information that right. she wouldn't have necessarily received in her exactly. prior right. training or history of working. It wasn't like, oh, go over there, pick that rock up. The guideline is underneath that rock or a piece of coral that right. fell on top of it when you weren't looking. It wasn't information or something like that. But there are cases supposedly where the information is outside the realm of knowledge that the experiencer has, which is even more amazing. But then the thing you have to wonder, and it's one of the things that we we come across when we're researching Astonishing Legends in our cursory research, <laughs> is something mm -hmm. I haven't brought up in a while. But one of the things you have to wonder is in the few cases where it's like, oh, no, there was information that the person couldn't possibly have right. had, a secret about navigation that they were never taught or some other thing, are just those small handful of cases that are third man and air quotes cases. Just those few, maybe those are exaggerations or they're not properly vetted. We don't know if that really happened. And when you throw that extra little spice of the thing the person couldn't have known, the whole legend takes on a new level. It just, it becomes more and more magnificent because you're like, no, it's more than right. just a voice of reason that is is really just the calmer part yeah. of my inner yeah. self helping me avoid panic. This is the unknown it's part more of this than that, that we mentioned before. Is this uh, just yeah. your own mind saying like, look, you're not handling this <laughs> very well. So that bicameral mind says, okay, we're going to take on another character here and uh, that you'll pay attention to because you need an outside force, which is really just you or your imagination. Or is it uh, something outrageous like psychic ability where you're picking up on some vibe that's outside of you? Or is it really a visitation right. from some other uh, separate entity? We in? Is it going? I, yeah, I don't. I think so. I think the. I don't know how long this feed's gonna hold, but I think we're in. We hacked the feed. We just <laughs> turns out. Okay, great. We should get started then. Scared all the time. It's a podcast about things that scare us. Whoa! What are you doing? I'm making a trailer. They asked for a trailer. Like, got my trailer music. Doing my trailer voice. No, yeah, that's <laughs> that's false advertising. We're just a couple of idiots talking about things that scare us. This kind of seems like overkill. Maybe you should go for something spookier, like something scary. Okay, fine. Scared All the Time is a podcast about things that scare us. No, that's too scary. Okay, well, I only have one more piece of music. This will have to do. I'm Chris Kalari. And I'm Ed Vicola. And every week, we're going to take a look at something new that scares us and why. Uh, like this trailer going over a minute. Yeah, they said we definitely should not do that. Join us for season one of Scared All the Time. A brand new show from Astonishing Legends. Available anywhere you listen to podcasts. Hey, Richard Haddam here. You've probably heard me on Astonishing Legends, but now I have a podcast of my own, Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf, where I talk about all the books I love, the stories behind them, and how they made me who I am. The first time I read the Amityville Horror, I felt like I knew the Lutz family. George brooding and moody, Kathy paranoid and somehow guilty, the boys fighting like savages, Missy hanging out with a ghost pig named Jody. Maybe that's the part I identified with the most. Not the pig. The feeling that they were all losing their minds. That's when I learned there are basically six stages in the life of every parapsychologist. Curiosity, investigation, doubt, acceptance, James Randi, and depression. A hole opened up in the wall of his apartment, and an insect-like being, the size of a tall man, but in the form of an enormous praying mantis, stepped through. Odd, even for New York. We're leaving the highway now. 
Have you noticed the paved off ramp we took has turned to a gravel path and now a dirt road and now nothing at all? Have you noticed how quickly the sun sets here? It's too late to turn back now. Everything's closed for the night. Why not sit down? I'll light a fire. There's a story I need to tell you. I'm inviting you all to join me on Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf. Come for the books. Stay for the frankly surprising amount of oversharing. This is Kevin Hughes. Thank you for listening to Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. All right, so circling back to Shackleton, I think it's interesting that at first they didn't say anything about this. They went through this together and none of them said anything about it. When I first read that, that all three of them as they were crossing South Georgia Island. You thought of the Kakowski intruder? I, <laughs> I did think of that. And I know I said that to you, which uh, is, uh, and for folks that don't know, listeners who haven't been with us that long, we did an episode a while back called the Kakowski intruder, C-A-C-K-O-W-S-K-I. You can look that up where a brother and sister, Craig and Liz Kakowski, told the story of an entity that they had both seen in their childhood home and didn't realize that the other one had seen it until years later when they were adults and were telling ghost stories at a bar together. And this is the Craig Kakowski from Drunk History and Liz <laughs> Kakowski, who has been on a ton of stuff yeah. and co-wrote the movie Wine Country with my wife, yeah. actually. That's a really interesting story. And I did think about that because all three of these folks, Crean and Worsley and Shackleton, felt that there was a presence with them, and mm. none of them said anything to each other. One thing I do wonder, and it's not documented anywhere, is that in a lot of these stories, there seems to be that moment where the unseen companion vanishes. And so with regard to Stephanie, when she was in that cave, the minute that she found the guideline, she realized that she was alone again. We'll share some more examples where the same thing kind of happens. Oh, I'm, I'm out of danger. I know now that I'm alone. I have been left by whatever this thing was. I wonder for them if perhaps they were feeling that additional presence until they heard that steam whistle at Stromness and they knew that they were above the whaling station. They knew that they had made it to safety, even though they still had several hours of a very dangerous and perilous descent. I wonder if maybe that was the moment they were like, okay, we've gone from four back down to three, but that's not specified anywhere. So there's this moment where folks are saying, well, he didn't mention it at first. Now it's coming out later. He's just trying to romanticize the event so that the book can be a bestseller. And, you know, people are trying to make a living back then, too. And this guy, was a, he was an international hero. He spoke. He, he went on tour. And, like, who wouldn't want to go see? I mean, I would go see him right now if he hopped out of the grave and decided to make a speech. But that's the thing. Like, people were coming to see him from all over. And he was not necessarily addressing it. He seemed embarrassed about it at first. But then later, he talked about it a little bit more. Yeah, you know, that also opened up the floodgates for others to talk about it. Yes. And that's the thing. And then, of course, you get all these people speculating, oh, well, they were dehydrated <laughs> and exhausted and whatever. And, and yeah, they were. But, I mean, by that time... They'd been living with dehydration and exhaustion for a year and mm -hmm. a half. Like, they were in full-blown survival mode. And again, I'd, God, I need to stop bringing up Naked and Afraid, but I remember, like, <laughs> when, there was one episode yeah. of it where at the end of those, where they do, it's like 21 days, sometimes it's longer, sometimes it's just, you know, a person's alone, or it's a couple of people, or it's teams, whatever. But there was one I remember seeing, and they got to the end, and they have to do this usually ridiculous hike out to where a car or a boat or a helicopter or something picks them up and takes them back to civilization. And these two folks were leaving their Boma, their built little thing, and they had made some homemade thing. I don't even remember what it was. It was like a stick with a strap on it or something. Mm -hmm. And the person didn't want to leave it because yeah. he was like, no, I, I need, th this is survival. I yeah. can't leave this. Even though theoretically by the end of that day, they would be in a pickup truck right. going to a hotel. Well, it's their But that's the yeah. mentality. It's like yeah. this stick with the thing on yeah. it is that I need this to live. And you know that those guys, after living out there and they're eating elephant seals, and in some cases, and early on when they were on the ice flows, they had to sadly consume some of the dogs oh, they had yeah. brought with them. Mm. But they never had to eat each other and nobody died. Right. So, you know, that's the part to remember there. Even though they were at the edge of survival and they'd gone this thing that, like, I think it's a little bit of a throwaway excuse to be like, oh, they're all imagining this fourth thing. It's like all three of them were imagining that a fourth mm. person was with them because they were deluded and dehydrated. And I was like, right. that's where they've been operating forever. Yeah. And their journal entries prior to that, 
where they are in the boat crossing the Drake Passage or where they were living on the ice floe or where they were at Elephant Island and couldn't leave for a few days to go further in the rescue. There's nothing about ghosts, illusions, apparitions, nothing. Just that last stretch, which was so critical, the stretch that really mattered because if those three didn't make it, all 26 died. Yeah. And so that's what's really amazing about that story. And on page 40 of um, John Geiger's book, there's a segment that he puts in here where there was a writer named Harold Begbie who recorded a conversation with Shackleton in the London Daily Telegraph. He said, quote, and this is the interviewer, in your book, you speak of a fourth presence. And he said, Shackleton nodded his head. Do you care to speak about that? And he said that Shackleton was restless and ill at ease. And he responded, no, none of us cares to speak about that. There are some things which never can be spoken of. Almost a hint about them comes mm. perilously near to sacrilege. This experience was eminently one of those things. Just like Deliverance and Ned Beatty. But to your point about the uh, <laughs> naked and afraid, with the, that was, the stick yeah. with a thing on it, that yeah. was their Wilson the volleyball. How can I live without yeah. this? This means everything to me in this moment, yeah. The volleyball is also his third or second man in that Wilson right. is now that he's talking to himself. He realizes this, or he's talking to a, a volleyball, but it's the touchstone. Spoiler alert. No, come on. I just, it's the, <laughs> I'm kidding. It's the, kidding. Uh, <laughs> Wilson was making never a series yes. of volleyballs. Yeah. I almost uh, bought one. But <laughs> the idea, though, is that you have a touchstone, that you need somebody else to direct that rather than feeling like you're going insane talking to yourself. And it becomes the thing that gets you through it, no matter what that is. And in this case, it's a little different in that in the case of Tom Hanks, he realizes he must do this, kind of like with Shackleton. It's like, either we do this or we're going to die. It's like, well, what if we died sliding down? Like, we're dead anyway. We have to slide yeah. down. There, we yeah. have to build the raft. Well, yeah, what difference we, does it make? Yeah, if we're going to stay here on this island, that's going to be certain death eventually and a more painful drawn out. Let's just pull the trigger on this, take the chance. And that's a lot of what happens in these stories, especially with uh, mountain climbers, which is the number one group for this. They decide I can lay down here and die, and that is kind of the easy route. I mean, I'm you know I'm I'm frozen to death. I'm not really feeling much pain. You start to have that hypothermia, euphoria, where you start to feel warm. The uh, yeah paradoxical uh, undressing aspect of it, or something says no 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 you're not doing that. Get up, get up. Yeah, I can. Yeah. I'm going to guide you. Just put one foot in the front of the other. We'll do this. Whereas you could take the comfortable way out or the more comfortable way, but which has already been decided. And so that's the interesting aspect of that, where even if it's your own brain, and you would think logically to me that the thing that would come to your own mind is like, now we're fine here. We prepared for this as uh, the mountain climber thought. He said, like, I always kind of thought I would die mountain climbing and I was prepared for it. And they're like, this is fine. But something deep within him or something outside of him said, no, no, you're not. We're not going out like this. You're going to give it one last good shot. It doesn't always work, as we'll see in one of the anecdotes, but it has saved a lot of lives. Yeah, and here, this is another one of those things where in this particular case, and this doesn't just apply to certain legends, although it, I bet it does apply to a lot, is like the legend, you only hear about the legend if you live through it, if the person lives through it. There's no telling how many stories like this might have happened where a person was visited by someone and it didn't work out in a rescue. Well, before we get to the fascinating anecdote section, because again, I just love the stories and remember the movie Unbreakable, I believe, M. Night? Yes. Oftentimes there will be a, a pretty cool website that goes along with a movie opening that uh, somebody from the studios gets together. And this one was uh, Stories of Survival, I believe. And in this case, it was like some of the most amazing stories. I remember reading one about a guy who was in that just tremendous, like a hundred mile Alaskan Arctic race and he gets stranded and, and cut off and he's trapped. I think his leg gets mangled by a boulder and he, he takes a flat piece of rock and frees himself of the trapped leg and makes it out of there. Yeah. Wow. Uh, now I don't know if he had the third man thing, but that, you know, stories like that, it's unbelievable, but we're going to get to one of those stories. And I was surprised to read that, uh, the story that I thought I knew so well, Aaron Ralston's he did have a third man experience. Wait, I'm sorry. Wait, wait, wait. Let me ask you. Aaron Ralston, is that the guy that got pinned in the rocks? Yes. 128 uh, they hours. made the movie? Yeah. Yeah. Right? I, have, see, I haven't seen that, but I know who he is. They don't mention a third man in that movie? I have not seen the movie. And you, okay, I haven't either. <laughs> I haven't those, either. It's one of okay. those uh, dumb times where it's like I, I read a long article uh, by Aaron Ralston describing his, uh, his entire experience, which is just yeah. harrowing. Yeah. And he doesn't mention it there, but he does mention kind of a spiritual sign 
story with that. I'll save that okay. for when we get to that story. But I just wanted to recap about some data aspects of this phenomenon and, and who it affects mostly and what activities are they doing. So getting back to the body of the Sudfeld and Geiger paper, the sensed presence as a coping resource in extreme environments, which I believe appears as a chapter in the book, Miracles, God, Science, and Psychology in the Paranormal. There's a section here which talks about the sensed presence in EUEs. And again, that is extreme and unusual environments. Right. John Geiger did start a website uh, that he mentions in the book called the thethirdmanfactor.com, where he attempted to not only present these great stories that he come across in, in a survey, but also to collect new stories, which I thought was a terrific idea. But unfortunately, you know, it's hard to keep a website up or a yeah, podcast it's down. going. It's down. And it's I down. tried to go to that site too, because I was like, oh, I, that'd be interesting to look at. I'm not sure what's going on there, but, uh, you yeah. know, the book was originally yeah. published by Weinstein Books, which is now uh, defunct sure. uh, due to certain things happening to Mr. Weinstein. Of course. Geiger actually has a newer book out because the third man factor was 2009. This book is called The Angel Effect. We are never alone. Haven't read that, uh, mm -hmm. but it does talk about uh, connection to the third man factor because that was a bestseller. And that book was published by Hatchet Books or Hachette Books mm -hmm. in uh, November of 2013. So that's another yeah. one to check out if you're interested in this kind of stuff. We may talk about angels yes. further on down the line, perhaps. Well, continuing on with the body of the Sudfeld and Geiger paper, the sensed presence experience often occurs in wilderness environments like mountains, ice fields, jungles, and the ocean. Also, in all the spaces, sea, air, and land. So it's experienced by divers underwater, uh, by pilots in midair, and by astronauts in outer space. The SPE also occurs in man-made extreme environments or events, as with the survivors, uh, some of them, of uh, the September 11, 2001, or 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Centers, and also experienced by prisoners of war. SPE just you didn't explain it. Sensed presence experience. <laughs> SPE. Sensed presence. I, I'm just anticipating my mouth getting tired of saying that all the time. But yeah, uh, yeah. yes, the SPE. Or Scott Philbrick Esquire. <laughs> or, or the EUE. Or the EUE uh, well, yeah. a fascinating aspect about all of these stories, again, it starts to paint a picture of, uh, well, what's the data saying here? Well, the data is saying that perhaps it doesn't matter about the person or the situations because they vary so wildly and are so different. It's just a human nature factor that's very bizarre, but helpful in our survival over the years for some of us. Because although these environments differ greatly from one another, there are a few environmental factors they have in common. So one characteristic is that the physical and social stimulus environment is relatively the same or similar and unchanging. It's in this interesting because it makes me think about just the whole idea of sensory deprivation or right. like when you go, you and I both use the Calm app. Yeah. And sometimes when you're using a meditation in that app or something, you can turn on waves or you can turn mm -hmm. on these night cricket things or everyone knows about relaxing to white noise or mm -hmm. whatever. And that's what's interesting to me. And I, of course, a few years ago, and I, I know some people know this, I took a high-end digital recorder that we have and recorded like six hours of the breaking waves yeah, yeah. down at uh, Carolina Beach here in North Carolina. It's very popular. Yes, and then uh, Sarah mixed that a little bit for us, and we put it. You can you can download that, by the way, if you're a listener <laughs> to our show. You can look for it's called Astonishing Waves for Relaxation, and it's also set even in our back catalog not to have any commercials in it. It may have one at the very beginning or something, but it's just under. It's a good to sleep by if you yeah. like hearing the North Carolina coast, which can be very violent at times. But my point is that idea of like waves or the silence of mm -hmm. space or the wind blowing in a blizzard or whatever that thing is that you do that sort of tunes you out. It does make you wonder psychologically yeah. and in terms of how your brain works, is that opening the doorway for this experience, whether or not this experience is internal or external? Yeah, I think you're right because there is a monotony aspect to the phenomenon and it doesn't mean total silence, or it can, as right. with the case with astronauts, it can, or as we talked about earlier, being on a sailboat in the ocean, of course, you can hear the wind and part of the sails flapping and the, uh, yes. uh, the clanking of the, uh, with the rigging on the, on the, on the mizzen mast and whatnot. But there's a repetitiveness about that. But in this case here, I want to ask you, the physical and social stimulus environment remains unchanged or unchanging and I would take this to mean that the extreme environment remains extreme in its own way 
for the duration of the event, meaning, you know, it's like the extremely harsh weather at a mountaintop stays at its dangerous level continuously. You, you hear the, the howling winds, but the, the winds are still, yeah, it's not quiet, but right. the, it becomes like a white noise thing. You kind of white out. Yeah. And it, it, here's another thing, by the way, and I don't know if people are old enough. There's going to be people in our audience that are not old enough to have ever done this, but you and I are of a certain age. And <laughs> I can remember anyway, when the TV stations went off the air, we've mentioned this before, and you get the snow on the TV, and people who have watched the first original version of oh, Poltergeist yes. will know about this, mm -hmm. where you could sit down in front of the TV. This is not good for your eyes, by the way, cathode ray tubes zapping you with <laughs> radiation. But like, you sit down in front of the TV, and you could look at that snow, and it's absolutely mesmerizing. But it's not too different, though, from staring into a campfire. And everybody's done that. Uh, yeah, yeah. You get kind of into this zone, which is an amazing place to be. It's very yeah. relaxing, even without external substances, which a lot of people take camping. But, like, you can just zone out. Whether you're at the beach and you're looking at the surf, especially at night, right. or you're looking at a campfire, mm -hmm. or you're staring into the static of an old TV you're synchronizing yourself with some sort of uh, gateway, it seems like. Almost. Well, now, okay, now you're talking about the scrying yes. method here, where you're you're letting yourself go and drift into an opportune or opening of perhaps a gateway, either in your own brain or psyche or your subconscious or tapping into a, a spiritus mundi of uh, fortune telling, in a sense. So in regards to that... You do have the setup here, I think, environmentally a lot of times, but not all. Where you're out in nature here, you are experiencing something that is harsh but monotonous in a way or just right. repetitive or like we talked about with silence here in a sense. Talk about being trapped in an underwater cave and running out of air as in the case of the cave diver Stephanie Schwab in, in Geiger's book. You can imagine it's calm, the water's still. And it's, it's, it's pitch black. Yeah, it's pitch yeah. black. And, and I imagine, again, I, I don't dive. I I wish I did. But I imagine you're just hearing yourself breathe through the regulator. So whoosh, that's the only real noise you hear other than maybe the bubbles and yeah. a little bit of the water swashing around. But it's in another sense, it would be calm. And I, I imagine that's some part of the appeal when you're not panicking and in danger of diving in that there is a, a calm sense, and especially being uh, the fluid movements of being underwater in another scenario, it would be terrific. Much as the euphoria of mountain climbers finally reaching the summit and looking out in the vastness of what you've just conquered. But yeah. when you're about to die, it takes on a whole nother tone. Uh, so you're trapped, you're starting to panic. It could be midair or in outer space, but that isn't changing. You know, So that aspect of it isn't changing, but the environment is also unforgiving. And in talking about the social stimulus environment being relatively the same, I would also take that to mean then the experiencer is either solo, so that's your social experience, it's just you and whatever right. voices you're hearing, or the enduring phenomenon is experienced by the same group of people for the duration. You know what I'm saying? Like with Shackleton, it's just the three guys. Yeah. And so yeah. your little group is, it's not like you meet other people because that, that of course, uh, means you're rescued or now you have to deal with them or another party. And then that's your new social circle. So the social stimulus aspect remains the same. You know, there's a reason they call it being in the trenches together. Yeah. That is a, a factor too, a binding factor, because one of the things that we mentioned in the cold open actually was the idea of being alone together. And this is something, again, I mm -hmm. read about in Geiger's book, which it's like, because there's a difference between being a soloist, you're by yourself, you're in this uh, crazy scenario, you're all alone, you're crossing the ocean alone in an airplane or whatever. Or there's the other case where it's Shackleton, Crean, and Worsley. The three are alone together crossing yeah. South Georgia, but they're going through this experience together and they're experiencing all of those sensory inputs or deprivations together, which also binds the people in a way- right that you only know if you've been through it, which of course, combat veterans know this stuff. Anybody that's had a really hard job, yeah. anyone that's gone through a high level of stress with someone else, you come out on the other side of that feeling like siblings, right, in some cases right. even closer than siblings. So that's a factor too. Yeah, no, for survival, you have to stay engaged. Yet another movie reference in Lawrence of Arabia. I do remember, it's one of my favorite things you see uh, in one scene where they have to cross this vast desert the Turks are not expecting him to do that because that's the hard way. Days and days on camels crossing the open desert. And Peter O'Toole, as Lawrence, is on his camel and he's just got this vacant look. My grandfather in World War II would say that it's the thousand yard stare. Right. And I just remember uh, Omar Sharif, I believe, is like, Orens, Orens, 
you're drifting because yeah. he's just not he's not there and like yeah. that's not a good way to be that is not in a good position you have to stay engaged yeah or otherwise your mind is just going to drift and then other bad things happen but that's another aspect of the physical hardship condition with other factors in this phenomenon not, by the way another great book seven pillars of wisdom by t oh. <laughs> unbelievable super long book yeah. but really mm. amazing yeah yeah it's on the list yeah, it's on the list. Uh, well, there's other hardship factors physically here, uh, like hunger, thirst, illness, or injury, uh, psychological stresses, temperature, experiencing very hot or very cold temperatures, or alternating between the two, and then the the danger of the situation. These can all be significant contributing triggering elements. So now we get to the data. And in Geiger's research for the book, a survey of 58 recorded cases of the sensed presence experiences had examples from people in quite different environments and undertaking quite different activities, like explorers in tropical jungles, which we'll, we'll have to ask Kinga and JJ if they've ever been in that kind of danger or know of any stories. Oh, yeah. And that ranges to pilots and astronauts, to divers, and again, in human-caused extreme environments like concentration camps and with prisoners of war. Why stop here? Another movie reference, uh, Bridge on the River Kwai, to your point oh, about yeah. there has to be a structure for things to function under extreme conditions like that. And the Japanese, as with the British prisoners, the British officers, they mandated that they did not work. They had to keep instructing the other lower ranking prisoners of war to keep working to build the bridge. Mm -hmm. And so that's when you had Alec Guinness. He had to still be in charge and they had to still follow orders. Otherwise, it would all just devolve. Right. And so right. the Japanese realized like, well, no, that if you want this bridge built, you're going to have to uh, not have the officers work and still be in charge. You know, I won't spoil that one for you, but <laughs> but but in pointing out that case, that's another aspect where it's not just uh, mountain climbers and divers. It's just somebody in an extreme situation. And uh, some survivors of these brutal conditions have also experienced the SPE or the sensed presence experience. But one really interesting data point in the survey was that the above scenarios were only a small number of the types of cases recorded, at least by Geiger's research. The largest sampling, almost by half, were experiences in mountain settings at both high elevations and at lower altitudes. What's going on there? What is the data saying? Because the next common occurrences uh, happening were in ocean settings involving solo sailors, crews on racing yachts, and shipwreck survivors. Uh, the most common grouping after that was the polar explorers. So to your point here, Shackleton's ordeal contained three of those elements, having scaled significant elevation increases and descents, uh, the wrecking or grounding of their ship, and all during a polar expedition. And that's why it's such a classic case. Also, for the reasons you mentioned, that it was one of the, the major first examples of that coming out into the uh, the public sphere and then opening the gates for other people at Explorers, people of note who have reputations to uphold to come forward a little bit with their stories, even though they were still hesitant. But it's like, well, Shackleton talked about it. I'm not going to feel like such a dingbat for telling about my story. It's the same thing with the paranormal stories. I think you've noticed by now, Scott, uh, over nine years that people seem to be a little more willing to share crazy stories of things that happen to them because they realize that stigma is slowly being chipped away at. Well, we do what we can. <laughs> well, it's, the, <laughs> it's the zeitgeist. Yeah. So zeitgeist. in mountain climbers, though, why is that happening? Because, again, that's about half of the stories, at least, that Geiger uh, et al. were collecting. Uh, so mountain climbing seems to be the activity with the most number of sensed presence experiences or third man events. I can almost hear Dunning and uh, <laughs> Shermer and Joe Nickel all saying, well, mountain climbers, they all are, don't have oxygen going to the brain. Well, that, it's, yeah, you know, that, they're that deprived is, of maybe O2. so, maybe so, because, but uh, in Antarctica, that's not, you weren't at a high altitude. Well, no, that's, and that's the thing. If you're going to, if you're going to label until that, they, uh, it, well, I guess on the South Georgia Island, they were up at about 4,000 feet, but most of the time I think you're, you're actually a lower, I no, don't know. I, you know what? I have yeah. no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> I don't know. As far as elevation Googling altitude in Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> before well, I, I say, anything. I think we clearly pointed out is that uh, <laughs> you can be underwater or in outer space and these yes, things still happen. That's true. Again, though, those are all difficult environments from an oxygen standpoint. <laughs> well, it's not just, yeah, but not just oxygen, though. Like I said, yeah. you're you're in a POW camp, and it's just being in, in an extreme and difficult hardship 
which right. is the fuel for this, but not necessarily. You can be in other scenarios. It's just that that's the most triggering environment, it seems, for this condition. Yeah. To point that out, a study conducted in the year 2000 involving 33 Spanish mountain climbers undertaking high altitude ascents found that one third had experienced hallucinatory episodes. This is drawing from the paper again, with the most common description being, quote, the sensation of an imaginary accompanying presence behind one's own body. Hmm. Here you go. So one explanation from an expert on the physiology of cold and altitude, Dr. Griffith Pugh, attributed the significant number of cases to a, quote, decay of brain functions, end quote, caused by high altitude. So, you know, to me, again, that explains some of that. I'm willing to buy that, but it is a little bit... See, I uh, called it. I <laughs> predicted. I didn't see this yeah. a minute ago. I predicted that's what somebody well, was going to say. that's obvious. I'm, I'm ready to buy into that, and I think that may explain some of it, but it is like the explanation of infrasound being the reason for all ghost sightings. Yeah. It's like, well, you know, if you do that, then people see a, a gray blob out of the corner of their eye, which is also a part of this explanation for the third man factor, people sensing or seeing something out of the corner of the eye. Yeah. And it's like, okay, I'm willing to buy that if every ghost sighting was a gray blob out of the corner of your eye, and it's not. Well, no, and I'll, I'll remind folks again, going back to a very early episode of our show, The Laughing Indian, the subject of that story, a good friend of mine, Mark, who shared yeah. that story with us, said that on the same property that that happened, his mom would routinely see a British redcoat in the woods yeah. out of the corner of her eye while she was out doing gardening and things like that. But when she would look directly over at him, he would not be there. Oh, you know, well, we talked about a little bit uh, a terrific listener and uh, friend of the show wrote into us with one of their Halloween stories, a, a true tale that had a great anecdote about there is some talk uh, amongst the paranormal ghost hunting circles that it has to do with the length of the rods in your eye, the rods and cones, and that the ones on the periphery of your eyeball are able to pick up those sensed perceptions better. The images that you can't right, see directly and Which on. would be an evolutionary reason probably has to do with self-preservation. This is all leading to so self-preservation. things can't sneak yeah. up on you. Well, no, that's what we're essentially talking about here because it's preserving the selves. But now let's get to the interesting anecdote, shall we? Yes. Well, there's one early example. This would be from 1933, where this phenomenon had been reported on publicly. And again, Shackleton, of course, was earlier. And, and I'm sure this didn't start, as we said at the beginning, from the turn of the century. It was always going on, but you just didn't hear much about it. Right. It's like the men in black stories and the black eyed kids or the black muck or whatever. You, there's different terms for earlier generations. But this one is about British climber Frank Smythe, who came to within about 300 meters of summoning Mount Everest in that that solo part of it. Yeah, and that just the end of it was solo because right. he had been with a large team that had <laughs> dropped like flies all the yeah. way up. And then at the very last minute, the other uh, guy that was supposed to go with him, a man named Shipton, was like, I, I can't go any further. So now he was on his own trying to make the last reaches to the summit. And right. at the time, right. he was at the highest altitude anyone had ever been. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. at this point, uh, even though he had other climbing partners, he's alone. That's another aspect of this phenomenon as being alone or with the same group of people as we just mentioned. Right. But in this case, though, he's really suffering the effects of, uh, I think, the high altitude and the weather. And he's uh, he's near the end of his rope. And speaking of ropes here, he decides that's it. I've got to turn back. And then he felt there was an unseen companion aiding him at some point. And he says, quote, this feeling was so strong that it completely eliminated all loneliness I might otherwise have felt. It even seemed that I was tied to my companion by a rope. And that if I slipped, he, quote, would hold me. And so at this point, though, he stops to rest and he pulls out a Kendall mint cake. Now, just a little personal aside here. I actually ordered one of those from REI. Back when I used to do more camping, it's like, well, that's cool. And there's a uh, there's a ringing endorsement from Sir Edmund Hillary talking about, uh, speaking of <laughs> Everest, really cool. I thought like, well, that sounds pretty tasty and, and functional and something I should have in my pack. But right. I was envisioning something like a, a hard biscuit, yeah. uh, like corn pone or sea biscuit or right. hard tack but with a minty, delicious flavor that I could yeah. chew on and, and hopefully uh, loosen up with some water. Not the case. It really just is a rectangular flat, about a centimeter thick brick of sugar that has mint oil in it. 
Oh, okay. But it, has, well, it does have a know. cool wrapper from uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> from ages ago. And I was slightly disappointed. I was like, well, this is just sugar. But yeah. as Sir Edmund Hillary said, I think at one point when he was on his climb that they were, when they were down on rations, would just have handfuls of sugar washed down with lemonade. Yeah. Because yeah. you just need the fuel. You just need the fuel to get well, you no, through. Well, no, that's how I feel when we're having a late night recording session. Like right now, for <laughs> right. example, on the last break, I ate two Cadbury Easter eggs. So, Well, there you go. Um, you just need yeah. the sugar to get and you through. And that's what's powering me through. Right. Yeah. So that's that's what the mint, it's just a minty block of sugar. And what's interesting is that he just breaks off a piece and he turns around to give it to his companion. And he says it was almost a shock to find that there was no one there to give it to. So it was only then when he decided- He was so sure yeah. that that person was there. It's like, can you imagine, just imagine him <laughs> sitting up on top of the mountain. Yeah. He's getting this thing out. And he's like, if you were there, if you were just yeah. like observing a guy sitting by himself, highest altitude any theoretically person has been, except for the Sherpa who took his laundry up there to get it dried. <laughs> but like, <laughs> right. like the, and he's, he's taking out his little cake and you're like, oh, he's going to eat this cake. He's going to be okay. And then he breaks it in half and just hands it to the air. <laughs> yeah. Well, th that's the point of this is that I, I know you could say he's in a severe delirium and suffering yeah. altitude sickness, exhaustion. He's uh, he's a little bit foggy, but yeah. you're so used to the feeling of this companion that you expect him or her to be there. And he turns yeah. around and, and, and then you're shocked that they're not. Right. When he decides he has to turn back and he descends to another camp where there's actually people there. And there are other members of the expedition waiting for him. Yeah. It was at this point, though, that he felt suddenly alone, as he said. Like, suddenly, yeah. they're gone. Because gone. he found other people there. Right. And he was saved. Which is what we were just talking about a minute ago. Exactly. Right. It's right. like this point where it's like, it's almost like a light switch is flipped. Now, so I, they, this well, is the part that I wonder <laughs> yeah. whether this is part of the bicameral mind or whether, again, this is internal or external, mm -hmm. this experience. What precipitates that disconnection that, that seems to come so quickly? So there are... Get not hard and fast rules, but real set factors, I guess, or or just how this happens is pretty set, which also to me makes it very curious in that are we all really just experiencing the same thing? I mean, why is it so similar between all these different and disparate people under very different conditions? You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. uh, and it's not all exactly the same. It's not cookie cutter for everybody, but it is like the dying of the light here. When you go into the tunnel, like, why is it a tunnel? Uh, does mm -hmm. everybody, not everybody experiences that, but why is it so common for everyone? Is it just like, is that being human then? And But why is it for everybody? Why is that tape oh, that man. your body just God. plays when you're about to die, why is that tape the same mostly for everyone? You know what this reminds me of just by the way is um, Richard Haddam's new show, which oh. is coming out in a couple of weeks. And <laughs> yeah. I've had the, the privilege of hearing all of season one. Right. One of them is uh, he's talking about that book that talks about bad near-death experiences. Oh, yes. It's uh, so scary. <laughs> like uh, that epidemic. And his show is not, it's by the way, don't get the wrong idea because right. it's not telling stories like we are. It's no, no. more about how those stories connect to his life and yeah. going up and becoming a writer and everything. But that particular segment, it's, it still creeps me out to this. It's something he's talked about on yeah. our show before. It's creepy. The people that have the bad NDEs. Very creepy. It, right. I believe I yeah. mentioned in that episode, folks. So uh, yeah. tune in oh, okay. hear, there you tune, go. Tune in here about that. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I chuckled when he told me that uh, I was going to be featured uh, in a small part. But this next anecdote is, it's probably something I would do. <laughs> well, actually not. But we did talk about earlier here in a case where somebody didn't make it, but there was some evidence of their experience. And that happens with uh, Maurice Wilson, who was a British climber. And as the paper says, Smythe wasn't the first, of course. Uh, you know, you had Shackleton and uh, wouldn't be the last. But this was a documented case here where uh, this British climber, Maurice Wilson, uh, the paper says he has a mystical bent. And he was on Everest on a climb within about a year of Smythe. And he also felt a presence with him. The difference being here is that Wilson, as the paper says, was singularly ill-planned and ill-equipped for his expedition. He had no climbing experience and he felt that his religious faith would be sufficient to see him to the top of the oh, world's tallest no. mountain. This is like that <laughs> poor missionary that went to that uncontacted tribe and got yeah. shot on the beach. Well, uh, he did not survive that climb in 1934, but his diary was found and in it, he recorded the feeling as he said, uh, he was laying partially snow blind, suffering from altitude sickness, that someone was with him and quote, strange, but I feel that there is somebody with me in the tent all the time. Okay. So there's that example of the help came, but didn't 
successfully rescue it. Look, it, it, it can't work miracles. I mean, in a sense, that is a miracle. But it's also yeah. like, dude, you have you have no equipment. You don't know what you're doing. I uh, I can't help you out of this, but I will hold your hand. Right. And so that's a comforting thing where it didn't save him, but it was recorded that there was a, a presence. So that's kind of cool. But that is one case where, yeah, it didn't quite work. But at least you had some company in your final moments. So continuing on, there's just a few more anecdotes that are uh, worth mentioning because of the different aspects. You're starting to get the ideas, right? Yeah. And that they're all saying that there's somebody there in various aspects, but they vary slightly again. So I often see this range, this um, dial of, uh, of experience here on the meter. Again, the photo's too blurry. The photo's not blurry enough. Here, right. it's like the, the experience is not similar for all of it, so it's not believable, or it differs too much to be believable. Right. But it's all of the same vein, so everybody's having a slightly different experience, but under the same similar conditions. And again, yeah, a lot of these are Everest, but you know that is the big one there. That's where, uh, one, that climb is going to be documented, more likely, and be noteworthy. And it also depends on the person. Like Reinhold Messner, one of the most famous climbers of all time, he felt a presence on Everest, but also Nanga Parbat. He thought there were companions there that provided psychological help to stem the loneliness. That was one thing. And then people say, well, his body was inventing ways to provide company. But one of his uh, solo climbs of Nanga Parbat, he is quoted as saying, I am holding a conversation with someone who is sitting at my side. Is it human? It seems there is another presence besides my own. That is all I can say. It isn't just a voice I hear. I actually sense a physical presence. There is a 1999 album by uh, North Carolina native artist Ben Folds, uh, uh, his band, the Ben Folds <laughs> right. Five, called yeah. The Unauthorized Biography of Reinhold Messner. Oh, yeah. And we've mentioned this on the show before. When they did that album, absolutely no idea who Reinhold Messner was. They just made the name up. They <laughs> really? did not realize wow. that Reinhold Messner was the first man to do a solo ascent without oxygen on Everest. Wow. So just a little aside there, you know, because that's what we do. We bring you we bring you the big picture, folks. We're factoid heavy. That's pretty yeah. cool, though. I, I yeah. like the uh, the randomness of that. And uh, <laughs> and also the band. They're quite yeah. talented. But there's other uh, strange things that you're talking about, either giving somebody uh, a piece of your cake or feeling that they're holding you with a rope or actually sensing them, yes. not just a, an idea or thought in your head. You actually feel them, you know, in the way yeah. that a lot of people describe a ghost encounter or a, uh, a shadow person that they they felt they were there there's right, something more right. than just seeing it right for example polish climber jerry kakushka i hope i'm getting that right he was in a difficult situation dug into the snow and he's uh, cooking something up on a stove some tea and he said uh, just then i experienced quite an inexplicable feeling that i was not on my own that i was cooking for two people mm. and something else interesting he said that uh, he felt uh standing beside this other person and from time to time i let him pass so that he could go ahead yeah like you're not seeing some, it's just odd, such an odd thing that you, you, you can't see them, but you feel them and you just like, you're doing everything as if they were there. Yeah. And I don't, this makes me wonder. I know earlier I mentioned uh, John Krakauer and his books, as well as Sebastian Younger mm -hmm. and uh, Krakauer wrote Into the Wild about Chris McCandless, who hiked out to that bus in Alaska and yeah. passed away in the bus. Mm -hmm. and, like, I wonder oh, if yes. he ever had an experience like that, but I don't think he left behind anything indicating that he ever felt like <sighs> someone was with him. You know, I because he died out there. Yeah, so. and there was a diary, I believe, but uh, yeah. he, I, that'd be a good question. Yeah. And are you, at some point, maybe too delirious? Like, he he had accidentally poisoned himself with those potato yeah. Uh, yeah. berries, I think. It's yes. hard to say, and in a different condition. But the factors are right. I would not be surprised. But in, in this case, there are cases where somebody actually feels something, not just seeing right. or sensing, as with the Australian climber Michael Groom in an ascent on Kang Chenjunga, 1987, where he says, I felt the presence of someone in the tent next to me. He knelt close by my right side, placed a firm hand in the middle of my back and lifted me into an upright position. My breathing now became easier as I rested my dizzy head between my knees, but I still felt the presence of someone watching over me. So that's where you actually feel somebody lifting him yeah. up. Yeah. That is completely different from any that we've discussed so far. I mean, it's one thing to hand something you can't see, a piece of mint cake. It's another to have it helping you yeah. stand up when you're at the end of, of your rope. Right. You know, it's that's really fascinating. Well, here's another case here. More recently, 1994, where climber uh, American Steve Swenson, again, in a climb of Everest, and he was forced to spend two nights 
at the 27,000 foot level here on the second night, he had three separate sensed presence experiences, much like Ebenezer Scrooge, perhaps <laughs> visited by three different spirits. One right. was a woman who urged him to stay awake through the night. Okay. When Good advice. if he did fall asleep, he would have risked death. Yep. A second character here, the second spirit of a Christmas present, he said, was a jolly Sikh man, S-I-K-H, who implored him in the morning to continue his descent. And then finally, a third presence, an unidentified being who accompanied him on the way down to safety. Hmm. Swenson said, quote, these characters were very real and I was taking their advice. Everything, every piece of advice I was getting was exactly what I needed to do. Now, here's my question for you, Scott. Is that a case where maybe Swenson knew what to do, but couldn't think straight? Right. Or maybe he didn't know the advice. Like I said, sometimes right. like, we don't yeah, know though. We yeah. don't know that in that, in that case, we don't know. Again, yeah. we're trying to get at, is this coming from outside of him? Would he have known this or guessed this if he were in a different condition or better? Yeah. If he better was health? relaxed and comfortable and knew, and, and he was thinking about the scenario. It is something that I think climber Wilfred Noyce called the second self, where we yes. mentioned this briefly, where you're not sensing a person that you can't see beside your presence. Sometimes you actually see yourself as a second self or a second person right. in that scenario. And then we, we'd mentioned earlier, uh, talking about the out of body astral self projection. Well, John Geiger talks about a case, and I love this experience because what a formative childhood uh, experience where he was with his dad, who was a geologist at the time. And he, I think he was seven years old. Yeah. And he's out on kind of a field trip with his dad, a hot summer day. And they're just out trouncing around uh, out in the uh, uh, open plains or the woods there. And they come upon an embankment that they have to climb. And so dad goes up first. And as young Geiger is climbing up, there's a little escarpment there, a little, uh, I pictured as a, uh, maybe a rock or a little tiny little outcropping. And there's a rattlesnake there hissing, mm -hmm. coiled, ready to strike. Rattling, yes. A rattling, and, and not in a, in a bad, horrible, hissing way. And he just, in that moment, uh, he's so filled with fear and shock and not knowing what to do, he snapped out of his body and is now watching himself being confronted by the snake and also his dad. He goes into yeah. a third person yeah. experience. And in that moment, he sees his dad just reach down, swoop him up with one hand and, and placed him on his shoulder. And they got out ahead of the snake and up the hill. Yeah. And so he says, now that's not typically the same thing, but that's something going on there. Yeah. And that's probably what inspired him to write the book and to I do think the that research. Is part of you it, know, yeah. And what that reminded me of, frankly, and I, I, I can't remember, you know, we're, this is our 279th episode. So now I don't know what we have and haven't said over the years. As a kid, I encountered a rattlesnake because, you know, until I lived in uh, Denver from the time yeah. I was two until I was nine. And at some point during that time, I went on a hike in the Rockies mm -hmm. with family, and I remember walking up on a rattlesnake, but I can't remember anything else about it now. I didn't I didn't get bit. I don't think oh. it was dangerous. Like, I saw it, and I think I avoided right. it. It wasn't anything like Geiger's experience, but it's weird how that reading about that snapped that memory back into my head. Well, there you go. It's the sense of acute danger suddenly that triggers this experience sometimes. As with our last anecdote about mountain climbers, and yes, we've covered a lot of mountain climbers because, again, you about have to half get every of this, single one of them in here. <laughs> half every of the, mountain climber. Hey, listen, that's not me. I just that's, want folks uh, to know it's not just happening in the mountain. We did get one no, no. scuba in here, and also in part two, we got some maritime ones that are really. Oh yeah, no, no, no. We are going to uh, cover other stories, anecdotes yeah. from other realms of adventure. We're talking about this because for some reason, this phenomenon, as we said a while ago, it happens, at least in the studies of the, uh, was it was over 50 cases, it happened to mountain climbers. That just seems to be a yeah. more fertile uh, area to find uh, uh, this experience happening to you. And it could be a combination of the altitude, as we said, the exhaustion, uh, all these factors. Hypoxia. Hypoxia you've got uh, very, but very fit and usually uh, grounded <laughs> people but they're going through this experience. And as I said, with the Spanish climbers, 33 cases, a third of them experience this. Yeah. So it's just a weird yeah. thing that kind of happens, but all in different fashions. And, but speaking about the sudden feeling of acute danger in our last anecdote here, South African climber, Paul Firth experienced this when uh, suddenly sensing this danger, he said, quote, he suddenly felt like there was somebody behind him. That person, that being that was invisible, accompanied him down the slope, was just slightly over his left shoulder, 
the whole way down. And then he felt stronger. And then and just as he got further down the mountain, the companion just disappeared because then he was out of danger. And when he wrote about his experience, he said, quote, whatever the physiological details of these experiences, who can say why these helpful ghosts wander in the penumbral world of the edges of our perception? <laughs> That's going to wrap up episode 279 of Astonishing Legends on the Third Man Factor. We'll be back in two weeks with part two. In the meantime, look for Astonishing Legends Junk Drawer on Patreon at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends. Also, find and subscribe to the other two shows from the Astonishing Legends Network, Scared All the Time and The Midnight Library, wherever you get your podcasts. Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf is launching in about three weeks as well, so keep an ear out for that too. Astonishing Legends is edited by Sarah Voorhees Wendell at VW Sound and co-produced by Tess Feifel, who is also head of research and the social media manager. Our technical producer is Ed Vicola, or as we call him, the mechanic. Special thanks to our announcer, John Bolin. Hi, I'm Ashley. And Hi, I give I'm Kristen Albert. Hi, and I give I'm permission Kevin to Hughes, astonishing... and I give permission to Astonishing Legends. To Astonishing Legends. Astonishing Legends. To use, use my voice however, however they see fit. fit. Galaxy-wide in, in perpetuity. In perpetuity. I understand, I understand this. this. I understand this is with no, no implied, implied promise, promise of present, present or future compensation. compensation. Future or present compensation. Our theme, which is available as a ringtone, was composed by Judson Crane at foundermusic.com. All other music and sound design for the show is composed and created by Alan Carestia. Our logo was created by Tommy Beaver Design, and our animated graphics for social media and YouTube are done by Joshua Sloan at DeadStreetProductions.com. Every episode going back to September of 2020 has a transcription available on its corresponding webpage at our website. Earlier transcriptions can be made available upon request to astonishingcontact at gmail.com. Astonishing Legends would not be possible without you, our listeners. Visit our store at astonishinglegends.com or interact with us and other listeners on Instagram, Twitter, Discord, Facebook, and YouTube. You can also visit us at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends, where patrons have access to additional bonus content, including the Patreon-exclusive show, Astonishing Junk Drawer, which is available every week the main show is not. No part of this show may be reproduced anywhere without permission. Copyright Astonishing Legends Productions. Good night. <laughs>